When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. As we turn the page from Matthew 21 to Matthew 22, I hope that it turns our hearts as well. So that when God calls, we come running. With that, let's run to Matthew 22. The first 14 verses are the parable of the marriage of the king's son. The last and greatest of these three parables of the losers, or three parables of those who lost out. It's going to teach similar principles to what we saw from the parable of the two sons and the parable of the wicked husbandman. But it's going to put it in such glorious terms that it's not just out working in the fields. It's not just reaping and harvesting in the vineyard. It's coming to a wedding feast. And who would want to miss out on that? Especially when it's the king himself that's throwing the party. This is your chance to come into the palace. Maybe the one shot you'll ever have. So notice how the Lord teaches this. Like I said before, we saw in Luke 14, well, we didn't see, I skipped it. But in Luke 14, there was the parable of the Great Supper that Jesus teaches right after the people start fighting over where where they get to sit. Remember that discussion? The best seat in the house, and if you take the best, then there's only one way to go. So sit in the worst, and the Lord will move you up. It's in that context that he teaches the parable of the Great Supper, because it's a matter of coming in and sitting down to eat. But this one is in more of a second coming context. It's more of a much is given, much is required context. It's in the context of what are you going to lose out on if you don't meet the Lord's great expectations. Now, Matthew 22, verse 1, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables. And said, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king, that's God, which made a marriage for his son. So, the, who's the prince of peace? Who's about to get married? And who's he getting married to? This is Jehovah and Israel, and we, as we saw in so many marriage metaphors in the Old Testament. This is Christ and the church, as Paul will teach clearly to the Ephesians. This is the marriage of the Son of God. And he invites us all to celebrate with him. The parable says that the king sent forth his servants, there's the prophets again, to call them that were bidden to the wedding. But here's the irony. They would not come. So this is just like the son who said he would go to work. I mean, they accepted the invitation originally, but when it was actually time to come and party, they wouldn't come. They refused. They I mean, switched the metaphor And you have, instead of the son who wouldn't work, you have the wedding guests that won't come to the party. Remember when I switched the parable of the laborers in the vineyard to the parable of the birthday party? And it's not about me working all day and I still only got one penny? No, it's come and party with me. And who cares about the party favors? The Lord is making that same kind of switch here. Let's... Let's not worry about laboring in the vineyard for now. Let's come and talk about rejoicing together. Because a relationship, a covenant relationship is being formed. Do you have any idea what you'll miss out on if you don't come to the marriage? Well, verse 4. Again, he sent forth other servants saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed. All things are ready. Come unto the marriage. What are you waiting for? This is going to be a feast like you've never experienced. Oxen? We're killing multiple. Fatlings. This is the good stuff. This is, oh, wine on the lees, well refined. This is more than the fatted calf. This is a wedding feast that only a king could provide. And everything's ready and waiting. Just come. 
Notice how he keeps on pleading. He sends forth other servants. Are you sensing the parallels between this parable and the previous one? God does not give up on us. He keeps on inviting. But do we keep on rejecting? These people did. It says that they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. And with that, we're back to the parable of the wicked husbandman. They killed them just for coming and reminding people about a wedding feast? Man, you really don't know what the king is trying to offer. Some of the language behind this, by the way, entreated them spitefully. In other translations, it's simply mistreated. But it's worse than that. It's to treat them shamefully, to, be, to behave insolently and outrageously. It's to, the Greek suggested it's to exercise violence against them, physical or figurative, you name your, pick, pick your poison. But the actual original Greek word there comes from the Greek word hubris, which is interesting because hubris is a word we even use in English to denote pride but such a pride that feels like you are so in control of everything. How dare anybody say anything to you? No wonder these, these mere people, these subjects of the king, have such hubris that they can not just dismiss and destroy the servants of the king, but dismiss the king himself, which is really what they're doing. I also find it interesting to see these two extremes. The, on the one hand, you see people uh, just kind of shrugging their shoulders, making light of it, was the phrase. And others being so up in arms and outraged by this that they end up killing the servants that came to reinvite them. I've talked about this before, about the tendency when, when people attack faith, for example, to go on the extremes and either minimize faith, like it's no big deal, just make light of it, or maximize the perceived threats of faith to make it the ultimate enemy that must be opposed. Usually in scripture, you'll either see ridicule and mockery on the one side, that's the dismissive, uh, or violence and persecution on the, on the other. That's the up in arms, outrage. I've often described this as either dismissing or demonizing. Or another way to say it is to minimize or to maximize. In my classes, I've even showed what you usually see at the top corner of your computer screen, where there's one button to minimize and another button to maximize, and then a third button to just close the whole thing out. And that's really the ultimate goal of the prior two in this case. Satan doesn't care if you don't take the, uh, the gospel seriously or you take things so seriously that you're ready to fight it tooth and nail. Either way, he wants you to close down the possibilities of faith. And we see those exact things happening here. Now, among those that were minimizing, those that just kind of shrugged their shoulders, made light of it, and said, ah, I've got some other things going on, so thanks but no thanks. I'd lo love to be there, but I must oh, regretfully decline. What did they come up with instead? Instead of going to the palace, they wanted to stay on their farm. Instead of going to celebrate, they wanted to stay home and, and merchandise. <laughs> they wanted to sell things instead of receive things. See, that's the irony. The, the king was there to offer them the feast. But they thought they had better options back home. My farm can enrich me. My merchandise oh, could definitely do that too. And who has time to, to waste on the king or the prince when I could be working for myself and trying to get ahead? Now it's here that the Luke parable of the Great Supper really comes in handy. It's almost identical. It's not a king in this case, but again, it's somebody that has this great supper, massive feast, and he's inviting all these people to come, and they won't come. In, in Matthew's parable of the marriage of the king's son, the excuses they come with, up with are fairly vague. My farm, my merchandise. In the Luke account, they're 
their excuses are much more specific. It's really interesting. So this is Luke 14, 18 through 20. They all with one consent began to make excuse. And that tells us from the very beginning. That's all these are. These aren't real reasons. These are just excuses. But they've kind of come together with one consent. They're kind of whispering behind closed doors like, how do we get out of this? Well, let's come up with some good reasons. I, I know down deep they're just excuses, but oh well, here's the best we got. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. I mean, at least he's being polite about it, right? I pray thee, please excuse me from this. I just can't go. Because you bought a piece of ground and have to go see it? The ground's going to be there tomorrow. In fact, if you're just now thinking about going to see it, did you not see it before you bought the thing? Are you that rich that you can just buy real estate without putting eyes on it? Or are you that clueless and careless that you're just, oh, just anything for me. I'm sure, I'm sure things will work out for the best. But yeah, I've got to go see. Well, that's one. How about another? Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. So he's just as polite as his predecessor, but comes up with a different reason. Uh, the first guy had, had land. I have the wherewithal to plow it. Five yoke of oxen. But I haven't tried them out yet. I got to go on a test drive, okay? So, so sorry, I can't make it. Now, the third, another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. And he's not even polite, like, please have me excused, I pray thee. But he just calls it out, like, therefore, it's like, it's, it's obvious why I can't come. I have the most legitimate reason of all. I just got married myself. So, hey, glad you're getting married, but I beat you to it. And uh, I'm going to go stay home with my wife while you go and celebrate getting married to yours. Now, the interesting thing about this third one is that that guy actually does have a leg to stand on, as far as the law of Moses is concerned. Because according to the law of Moses, the, when you are married, you are off limits to the, anyone who wants to draft you into the royal army, for example. You cannot be enlisted your first year of marriage. It's, it's the law of Moses' way of helping newlyweds work things out, okay? And getting from creation through some minor fall into better atonement that first year of marriage. Figure things out, work out your differences, and two becoming one. Sometimes that takes a while. So yeah, focus on that. That will bless Israel more than one more soldier in the king's army, okay? You're excused. I wonder if this guy is using something similar it's like, I just got married myself, so I'm off duty for the next year. So, therefore, can't come. But again, on that, for that guy, I'm scratching my head going, if you just got married, then who are you? You're definitely not the king. Your wedding celebration would be nothing compared to this one. Well, maybe that's why he doesn't want to come. Because <laughs> he doesn't want to show his wife, like, yeah, sorry, I can't spread, spread the table like this guy. But on the other hand, wouldn't you want to bring your wife? Wouldn't you want to say to her, like, hey, guess what? The king must think highly of me, even if you don't yet. Uh, and, and he's invited me and you. He's invited us to be able to come to, the, to their wedding feast. In fact, maybe we could count, kind of count this as a, a second round of our own. <laughs> I remember once years ago, my wife has a, a brother that is incredibly generous and he was going to spend some time at a, uh, in Turks and Caicos in the Caribbean. And last second, he calls up my wife and I and says, Hey, can you guys come? You can have my frequent flyer mileage. We're already, we already paid for the, the beach house. Just come. All expenses paid. We'd love to just spend the time with you. And we're like, uh, yeah, that sounds great. And so we <laughs> canceled our weekend plans, which were non-existent, and rushed off to the Caribbean to have a blast with the king and queen. <laughs> and it was right during the time of our anniversary. And cheapskate me looked over at my wife and said, hey, isn't this an amazing anniversary trip? <laughs> and she's like, it was not an anniversary trip. Uh, you didn't shell out a penny for this thing, honey. Uh, do you, it, this does not count. I'm like, uh, please, because this is way better than anything I'll ever be able to get you for an anniversary trip. I mean, if I was this guy, that's what I'd be doing. Hey, let's have a round two of our wedding feast, and it's on the king this time. 
Well, for whatever reasons, and that's all the, these were. And in fact, that wasn't what these were. For all these excuses, nobody wants to come to the wedding feast. The son doesn't want to work for the father. The husbandmen don't want to produce in the vineyard. People don't want to come to the party? This makes no sense at all. Well, it certainly doesn't make sense to the king, but it's not just scratching his head, it's sharpening his sword. In Matthew 22, verse 7, when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And can you blame him? This is such an affront. This is like we're, we're killing the, the son because we just as soon kill the father. We'll reject the prince and his, in his marriage because we choose to reject the king himself. This is a personal affront, and the king is furious. He sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. This is just like the angry householder to his wicked husbandman. Sound like the Assyrian destruction? Sound like the Babylonian captivity? Sound like Greece and Rome? Yeah, you destroy, you, you reject the prophets, my servants? You reject my son? We'll see the army coming to destroy you, to burn up the city. That's exactly what Rome will do. And then the king said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. So what are we going to do from here? My son's getting married. There have to be people here one way or another. So here's the new plan. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Now you compare those guests to the guest list in the parable of the Great Supper in Luke, and it's a similar ragtag bunch. In Matthew, it was the bad and the good. In Luke, it's the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind, which is exactly the type of people the Lord already said you should invite to your parties since there's no possibility of them ever paying you back. Uh, that way it's totally selfless on your part. They don't deserve to be there, but they're humble enough to know it. It's also the exact type of people that would likely come running, since this is probably the only chance they'd ever have to come into a palace and spend time with the king. So you bet the lame and the halt will limp their way in, and the blind will feel their way to a spot at the dinner table, just grateful for the chance to associate with royalty. Even then, Luke says, there was room left over. And that would still be embarrassing to the king and the, and the crown prince. And so he sends his servants out one last time. And this time the direction is, compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Like it or not, we have to have people here. And if you keep this in a second coming context, and if you think about the ten virgins, for example, that parable is definitely second coming context. The marriage of the, of the, of the, lamp, the bridegroom and the bride, is the book of Revelation for you, this is all second coming material. And if you think about it, at the second coming, like it or not, there will be people here. Ready or not, here he comes. And to think about both good and bad on the earth, and worthy and unworthy, and are there people prepared or unprepared for that great and dreadful day of the Lord? With that in mind, look at Matthew 22, verse 11. When the king finally comes in, relieved. Whew, okay, this is not going to be an embarrassment for my son. There are people here. But notice what he, sees, what he sees. When the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, Notice he calls him that. That's good, at least. Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. No way to rationalize or justify himself. The day of excuses has come and gone. How did you get in here improperly dressed? Well, having been given a chance to explain himself and the man knowing there's no, there's no excuse I can give, what's left for him? The king said to his servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the moral of the story, For many are called, but few are chosen. I called both sons. Only one ended up coming. I, I called so many times to those husbandmen, and they rejected my calls every time. I called people to the wedding. 
and they made excuse and gave reasons why they couldn't come. I called more and finally there was no more calling, there was compelling. There were people here, like it or not. But among those that I called, there were some that were not chosen because they did not choose to come on the king's terms. They probably felt well, like they deserved to be there. There's some of that hubris we were talking about before. And you know, I, I kind of run the place. In fact, I should be on the throne, not at some lower place on the table. And waltzing in, in their own clothing, unwilling to accept the wedding garment that the king would offer his guests, yes, they were cast out into outer darkness, unchosen because they wouldn't choose him. Now, some of you may remember that back in October of last year, Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve gave an amazing conference talk in which he talked about this exact parable. The talk was called, Put on Thy Strength, O Zion, the great Isaiah phrase. But he spent more time in Matthew than he did in Isaiah uh, to describe what putting on that strength looks like, what it's like to wear a wedding garment when you are invited to the marriage of the king's son. In it, he described Jewish weddings as the ultimate time of celebration. They could last a week or more. And because it was so, oh, such a big deal, it was a long time in coming, and they would send out invitations early, long in advance, so that people would know it's on its way. And then they'd send out servants again when it was time to start. So now it's now, now come running. You see the same kind of thing happening in this parable. Now, Elder Bednar also pointed out, as we've discussed, that a politely declining no, that does not do justice to the offense that they are shoving in the king's face. We are rejecting the crown prince because we are rejecting you. This is like the prodigal son. I'm treating you as dead. I just want my inheritance. I don't care about celebrating that your kingdom is going to continue. I'm worried about building my own kingdom. Thank you very much. So let me stay with my, my farm or my merchandise. Let me look at my ground or test drive my oxen or just stay at home with my own queen as we build our own kingdom together. It's all about them and not about the Lord. And refusing the king's invitation, in some ways, like it's the, it's the older brother of the prodigal son, that the father is throwing a major party. And the fact that his firstborn won't come in and celebrate with him Oh, that's offensive, too. The neighbors are going to be whispering behind his back. And the fact that the, king, the father would have to come out of his own party to go find this older son and invite him to come in, oh, that's, that's beneath him as well. Well, one other thing that Elder Bednar points out is that in this culture, especially if this is the king, and he's bringing anyone who possibly is willing to come into the wedding feast, then he's not expecting them to have their own wedding garment. No, he will provide one to them. And typically it's one that keeps them all on an equal playing field. That kind of like the clothing we wear in the house of the Lord. When we go to his palace for a wedding feast, we all look the same. So there's no distinctions of rank and order and wealth and so on. You wouldn't be able to tell so easily who's the bad or the good or who's the wealthy or the poor. And yet... As Elder Bednar points out, the effrontery of this, this friend, despite the fact that the king calls him that, this man does not act like any friend of the king. The obstinance on his part, I'm going to do things my way, and yet he is left speechless when given the chance to explain why he would do it. The day will come where our reasons fade and our excuses evaporate. And all the self-justification and rationalization that we were used to in life for coming unprepared, it goes up in smoke. As Jacob says in 2 Nephi 9, we will finally admit to the Lord that he was right all along and that we didn't do things his way as we should have. Elder Bednar also was wise to point out that there is a JST at the end of all of this. That seems to bring it all full circle. This is the exclamation point at the end. Right after that phrase of conclusion, many are called but few are chosen, the JST adds, wherefore all do not have on the wedding garment. So bringing it all full circle back to that one element of the parable. 
This boils down to being properly dressed. Now, I, I laugh about this because I'm never underdressed. I'm always overdressed. White shirt and tie is kind of how I, how, how I roll. And typically, I'll be out mowing the lawn in a white shirt and tie and throwing the football with my sons in a white shirt and tie and grilling uh, dinner on, out on the barbecue in white shirt and tie. There's very little you can do in life uh, in, that requires you to get out of your white shirt and tie. Well, I would much rather be overdressed than underdressed. I, it had been so long since I ever felt that, that it was a shock when I went to Oregon to pick up my son and we went to the temple. I just want to take a picture of him in front of his, his base of operations. But I had just flown there and we were going to drive back quickly. I didn't bring any church clothes and I was in oh, sweatpants and a grungy t-shirt and a baseball cap and, and I'm walking outside the Portland, Oregon temple with my son in his missionary attire. And patrons were coming in and going out, and I felt like a fish out of water. I felt so, I'm like, I hope nobody sees me. I do not, I, I mean, I want to be here, but I have no business being on temple grounds the way that I'm dressed. I know better than that. I, I, no wonder I feel so out of place. But to feel that way at the second coming would be infinitely worse. To to look around so embarrassed at how underprepared I am for that great and glorious day. If that was any wake-up call for me walking around the Portland Temple, it's a reminder to be well-dressed, to have on the wedding garment, not to be hiding behind the fig leaves, but to willingly come forward so that God can provide for me a coat of skins. Not clinging to my filthy rags, but laying my garments at his feet as the King of Kings comes in triumphantly and offers us his robes of righteousness in, instead. Are we seeing all these stories coming together as Jesus is teaching in these final days? This is what he's asking of all of us. The wedding, it's about, it's about the prince. It's not about the guests. We should just be honored that we're invited to come. If you've ever been a bridesmaid or a groomsman, when the bride and groom choose the wedding colors, you don't fight them on it. And you don't stick out like a sore thumb. You don't, no, I'm going to wear my own thing. If, that's, if those are the colors you want, those are the colors we'll wear. And what an honor just to be able to come and celebrate with you. That's how we're supposed to feel about this wedding. Now, obviously, the Jewish leaders don't feel that way about the wedding. Uh, they didn't like this round of story time as it's getting closer and closer to, to, to targeting them. So they get off the defensive and they try to get back on the offensive. Uh, forget the three parables you just taught. I've got three questions I want to trap you with. And they must have short memories because they don't recall that Jesus just trapped them with a question of his own and they couldn't get out of it. So they just avoided the whole thing about where did John get his authority? Now, notice the first question that they ask. We'll go to Matthew 22, verse 15. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. That's the plan here. We've just got to trip him up, make him, make him an offender for a word. Mark says it was certain of the Pharisees, so not all of them, but also of the Herodians. And if the Pharisees are church, then the Herodians are state. And both religious and political leaders are trying to destroy him. Specifically, they're trying to catch him in his words. So entangle him, catch him. Uh, the Luke version says they watched him and sent forth spies, which should feign themselves just men, that they might take hold of his words, that so they may deliver him unto the power and authority of the governor. Interesting. They knew they didn't have any power or authority of their own. They're just reaching out for somebody who might have some. And sure enough, they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, their state, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of, of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man. In other words, you're no respecter of persons. You don't care what people think. Uh, you can be trusted to tell the truth and not be swayed by popular opinion. I mean, that's why we're coming to you. Now, remember the detail that Luke gave us. They're feigning themselves to be just men. They're pretending. And so here they come, 
faking their own righteousness. Oh, lots of leaves and no fruit here. But asking the Lord, oh, we, we've got a question for you. And you're the best one to, to ask because, oh, you, you speak truth. And, and you, you're not a, a reed shaken in the wind either. Same with your cousin. Now, after that level of buttering him up, uh, we know that thou art... Well, I mean, in some ways it reminds me of Nicodemus, though Nicodemus was most likely more sincere. When Nicodemus said, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. Uh, so I've got a few questions about how the rest of us can come to God. Here it's, oh, you are so righteous. You always tell the truth. But this is just flattery. They're trying to trick their way into Jesus so they can trick him. Trip him up. Catch him in his words. And here's their question. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Those are your two options. You don't get any other. There's no getting around this one. So should we have to pay taxes or not? In the Mark account, by the way, they're totally insistent that he answer. They add a second question to the first. Shall we give or shall we not give? You have to pick one. Darn if you do, darn if you don't. No matter what your answer, we're going to make you look bad. Because if you say, oh, no, 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 we shouldn't have to pay taxes for Rome, to Rome, then we're just going to throw you at to the Romans and let them do our dirty work. You'll, you'll come across as some kind of anti-Roman zealot. Oh, in fact, now that I think of it, don't you have one of those in your Quorum of the Twelve already? Simon right alongside you, and the two of you are going to go take down Rome, and it's going to start by refusing to pay your tax? Huh. Then again, if you say, yes, it is lawful to pay taxes to Rome, we should do that. And then what does that make you? No better than the publicans. Oh, I guess you have a publican in your Quorum of the Twelve also, eh, Matthew? Uh, did you convince your master to go your way? Are you, is he a traitor to the Jews like you were? I mean, no wonder he stayed with Zacchaeus down in Jericho. He was the chief of the chief of the publicans. Now, you see the problem here? Will we turn Rome against you or, or Israel against you? <laughs> Either way, we're against you. And there's no getting out of this. Well, verse 18, there was a way. <laughs> Jesus perceived their wickedness. Luke, even better word, their craftiness. He sees right through their mask, their hypocrisy. He knows that they're just trying to trick him and trap him in his words. And so what does he say? He says, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? So let me look past the mask. Let me expose you for who you are. You're tempting me. You're not asking me. So let me do this instead. Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. He saith unto them, whose is this image and superscription? And they say unto him, Caesar's. <laughs> there he's leading them. They're walking right into his trap. And then saith he unto them, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. I love that. He doesn't go into some deep explanation of who should and who shouldn't owe taxes, uh, like he did with Peter when Peter had those questions. He doesn't say, oh, I'll just make sure. I mean, loaves and fishes? How about fishes with tax money in their mouth? I'll, I'll multiply those, and then everybody's off the hook. We can keep Rome happy, and the Jews don't stand to lose. How's that for a win-win? I mean, he could have done that. But no, he honors that difference that, he's, that they're making, uh, but makes a different difference of his own. Forget Roman versus Jew. How about heaven versus earth? How about God versus man? How about Caesar versus Christ? But let's pay each their due. In the meantime, on this side of the millennium, there will be earthly Caesars to appease, uh, to obey, I should say. They're in charge. And so if they are demanding taxes, I suppose we'll have to pay. But who's really in charge, and are you honoring him? The, the fact that the Roman coin had the image of Caesar on it was such a perfect visual aid for Jesus. Because then he could say, oh, that looks like it belongs to him already. So just return it to him. <laughs> if, it, if it bears the image of Caesar, it must be Caesar. So just render unto Caesar what belongs to him. He could have stopped there, but to add the other side is so powerful. Because he seems to be dropping a hint that we have a more important master. And 
we bear his image and superscription. From the days of Genesis on down, God created male and female in his own image. Or as Alma would say, have you received his image in your countenance? Is there a family resemblance here? There is. And as sons and daughters of God, what should you be rendering to him? Oh, all your heart, might, mind, and strength. Oh, yes, you can pay your earthly taxes to <laughs> little old Caesar. But as children of God, are you being loyal and true to him? It was genius how Jesus gets around this question. I've sometimes even asked my students, look at a tag on a piece of clothing or oh, the sticker on the back of a of a, uh, the laptop, or, or just anything that tells you where something was made. And as they look, they'll tell me all kinds of places. Made in the USA, or made in China, or hecho in Mexico, or just there's all over the world they're producing things. And then I'll ask them, look deeper, and this time with spiritual eyes, and tell me where this is from. If you have the eyes to see, it will reveal itself to you as, on, as one of, e of either two possibilities, because there's only two. It's either God or Mammon. It's either Christ or Caesar. It's either Zion or Babylon. So look closely. And if it came from Babylon, send it back. They probably won't return your money. That's okay. You don't want anything with their fingerprints on it. Just walk away. If it's made in Zion, then hold on to it. Cherish it. Because those are gifts from God that will point you back home to him. There's something powerful about differentiating between images and superscriptions and what has the world written all over it versus what bears the mark of God. What an answer. Verse 22, when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Sad that they still wouldn't go his way. Uh, the Luke account of this says they could not take hold of his words before the people which is tragic for them. I mean, no matter how hard they try to spin things, it's the people that, that are keeping them honest on this. The people would have seen right through it. And so they marveled at his answer and held their peace. I mean, Jesus has put to rest the Pharisees and the Herodians. It's amazing. It takes a lot to, to shut them up. But now it's the Sadducees' turn. And they'll pick up where the Pharisees and Herodians left off with a question unique to them. It has to do with resurrection, and marriage in heaven. Now, people will often attack the church for, this, for our doctrine of eternal marriage. And people who know their Bible think they have the perfect verse to skewer us with. Look at chapter 22, verse 30. And this is a great example of cherry-picking a verse to try to make us look bad. It says, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. There you go. Point blank. It says it right there. There's no marriage in heaven. So you guys are wrong. It's false doctrine to think that you can be sealed in a temple and have it sealed in heaven. God doesn't work that way. In fact, the last uh, interfaith dialogue I had with a bunch of wonderful evangelical Christians from all over the country, uh, this was just a couple of months ago, a pastor came to me with that exact verse and that exact question. And I've heard it so many times. Uh, there are books out there of questions to ask the, the Mormons. I don't think they call us Latter-day Saints. Uh, and that's definitely uh, on the list. Okay? But notice it in context, and context is everything. When people will throw anything in my face, some tricky part of church history, some, some other issue, step back, see the big picture, and understand what they're talking about. So let's do that here. The story actually begins in verse 23. The verse I just quoted was verse 30. So we have a while to, get, uh, to go before we get there. But verse 23, the same day came to him the Sadducees. And that's important to understand. And in case we don't know why it's important, notice how Mer Matthew clarifies. There came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection. Now this is interesting because Matthew usually avoids uh, clarifying Jewish things because he's a Jew writing to, El to other Jews. The Jews know this stuff. So it's more like a, a Luke that will typically have to uh, spell things out and say, oh, this is what's going on here. Luke, I mean, excuse me, Matthew knows his audience gets it, so he skips over those details. You would have expected him to skip over that detail too. 
soon as he says Sadducees, they're like, okay, what do I already know about Sadducees? Oh, well, for one thing, they don't believe in resurrection. But he wants to make sure. He's being very purposeful in foregrounding this information because it's going to be key to help us navigate the conversation that follows. Mark does the same thing, by the way, and Luke even intensifies it. And writing the Gentiles, he would need to. He says, the Sadducees, which deny there is any resurrection. It's not just that they say there isn't one. They deny the, even the possibility, as far as Luke is concerned. Now, they came to Jesus and they asked him, saying, Master. Well, that's always the word that they use, trying to, to ingratiate themselves to Jesus. Well, Master, Moses said, are we doing that again? Pitting prophets against prophets. Moses said this, but what do you say? Well, close. Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Well, you, right. Uh, yeah, I remember the law of leveret marriage too. Uh, it's the fact that in the Old Testament, uh, posterity is so all important that there were ways to make sure that everyone could have posterity including if a man dies without having children of his own, his wife is supposed to marry his brother. And their first child will belong to the departed brother, not the, the living biological father. Uh, if that brother dies, then you go on to brother three and, and so on. We saw that in Genesis chapter 38 last year with, uh, with Judah and Tamar uh, and living out the law of lever and marriage. So Sadducees, they're not telling Jesus anything he doesn't already know. But that's just the first step. That's going to be the first part of the equation. Now here comes the second. Verse 25, let's complicate this even further. Let's, let's raise leveret marriage to the nth degree, or in this case, the seventh degree. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. So here's the question we've been leading up to this whole time. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Now, you see the problem here? They're asking about the resurrection, despite the fact, as was clearly reiterated from the start, they don't believe in it. So they are trying to come up with some scenario that, that, that they want to dismiss from the very beginning. Their premise denies that. And now they're asking for a conclusion? It's like people that argue over the first vision accounts, but don't believe in the possibility of visions to, to begin with. And so now they're arguing over marriage in the resurrection when they don't believe in the resurrection? That is interesting. What they've ended up doing here is you take the practice of leveret marriage, you combine it with the doctrine of eternal marriage, and you make it so complicated with seven different marriages going on within the family that the, the person ends up getting so confused or frustrated that let's just toss out the baby with the bathwater and eliminate the whole thing. And what they were trying to eliminate was the doctrine of resurrection. That's the issue. And that's their question. In the Mark account, they really press the issue of resurrection because they're, the way they phrase the question, in the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, so they're just reiterating the point, whose wife shall she be of them? Now, as I tried to explain to my wonderful evangelical Christian friend, don't forget it's the Sadducees. Don't forget the focus is on the resurrection and their lack of belief in the resurrection. And then using something that just complicates marriage in general. And leveret marriage is about as complicated as they get. Pushing those together to try to take down the doctrine of resurrection. Now, think about this. They're taking a doctrine that they know and they know that Jesus knows. Moses said, here's leveret marriage. And then they couple it with eternal marriage to ask Jesus, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? My question to the Sadducees and my question to my evangelical friend, where did they even come up with that idea if it had never been taught, if it was not an option, if that kind of belief had never been entertained by Jesus or anyone else? There seems to have been some kind of understanding already of eternal marriage. 
Granted, I wish we had it clearly taught in the New Testament. I do. It'd be nice. But the fact that isn't and is just brought up in passing without any like, well, let's make up some crazy hypothetical. No, they already did the crazy hypothetical with the seven, seven brides for one brother. Uh, or seven brothers for one bride, I should say. For them, what isn't the hypothetical is the doctrine of eternal marriage. That's just an understanding. But for them, it's not the marriage that's the issue. It's the eternal that's the issue. Because they don't believe in the resurrection. Think about it this way. If there was no possibility of eternal marriage, where would they have come up with the question? It would have been a non-starter from the beginning. They wouldn't have had the theological vocabulary to even use that to make resurrection look too complicated to accept. Does, does that make sense? Think about it in terms of baptisms for the dead. We'll see this in a couple of months when we get to 1 Corinthians 15. The way Paul talks about baptism for the dead, he doesn't talk about it. He mentions it in passing, in a chapter dedicated to the defense of the doctrine of resurrection. Almost the same context. By the time he's writing this letter to the Corinthian saints, they're starting to wonder if resurrection is a reality. And so he brings up as many exhibit A, B, C, D, as many arguments as he can to say, no, look, think about all these people who have seen Jesus, the risen Lord. I'm, I'm included among that number, Paul would say. Uh, think about Adam dying, the fall. The fall requires a, an atonement, and the atonement includes the resurrection. If Adam died and death passes upon all of us, then Christ had to rise to pass resurrection to all of us. It's some amazing arguments, but one of the ones that's fascinating is that in a single verse, he just passes over baptisms for the dead in a, a mention with no explanation suggesting that he didn't consider any explanation necessary. He's like, come on, people, we believe in the resurrection. Because if the dead don't rise at all, then why on earth are we being baptized for the dead? Think about that. He was using baptisms for the dead as evidence to bolster their belief in the resurrection. You're baptizing for the dead. That's true. That's right. You don't wonder about that. Well, there's no point of that if there's no resurrection. They're dead, and they're dead, and that's all. And a baptism isn't going to change anything. So think about it. I love the fact that they're taking baptisms for the dead for granted. Because that's not the issue here. Resurrection is. And in the same way, they're not, they're not having to explain eternal marriage or bring this up. Like, well, what if? No, they're assuming that. They're just complicating it by coupling it with leveret marriage, to try to make the entire foundation of eternity, resurrection at all, seem, seem impossible, seem irrational. It's really genius how they're doing it, to be honest. Well, Jesus is far more of a genius than they are. So notice how he responds. Verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. You should know better than that, you who claim to know the word so well. And then his answer, which we've already mentioned. For in the resurrection, since that's the real issue here, in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Now what does he mean by this? You do err? Okay, you don't get it. But here's the point he's making. It's not in the resurrection that those marriages can be solemnized. In the resurrection, they're not, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. That those ordinances have to take place on earth. We have to do that here, just like baptism. That's why we do baptism for the dead, because among the dead, they are not baptized or given in baptism, if we want to follow the, the same kind of language. They're not, they neither marry nor are given in marriage there. That has to happen here, whether by a couple directly or by proxy, but by someone else that's here on earth. There's something about the physicality of, of ordinances that we do things with our body and we need a body to do those with. So to be baptized to be sealed. Now, this is even more clear in the Luke account. Chapter 20, verse 34 to 36, Jesus answering said unto them, the children of this world marry. 
and are given in marriage. See, it has to happen here, just like baptism. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, uh, no, there they neither marry nor are given in marriage. And then he uses another example of the same kind of concept he's trying to teach. Neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. So over and over he's hammering, resurrection, resurrection, resurrection. It's real, trust me. Believe me, I'm, I'm about to prove it later this very week. Now, what I love about Luke and his account, in some ways it's more helpful than Matthew's version. They, people tend to attack us based on Matthew. We could defend ourselves better based on Luke, though Matthew gives us the chance to do the same. I just like how he clarifies the difference between this life and the next, or in his language, this world versus that world. Where is the wedding supposed to take place? And I'm going, to be, I'm going to try to be clear here and differentiate between weddings and marriages. Because a wedding is an event. It takes place. It is solemnized. Something happens. There's a, there's a date. And then there's marriage, which is a, a state, a status. It's a condition that follows the wedding. Right? And are we understanding the difference here? Even the language that Jesus uses, whether in Matthew or in Luke, is talking about the wedding, the event. He doesn't say there's no marriage in heaven. He says there's no weddings in heaven because the way he phrases it, they are neither, they neither marry, that's a verb, it's the, the moment it happens, nor are given in marriage. Do you understand the difference here? This is really, really, really key. I, I hope this is making sense. If Jesus is being really clear and specific here, and he's going to need to be to be able to navigate around the Sadducees, Let's talk about the difference between a wedding and a marriage, uh, between a, a verb and a noun, between an event and a permanent status, or a status at least that is meant to be permanent. Let's start with weddings and marriages, shall we? The wedding has to take place in this world, because in heaven they neither marry nor are given in marriage. The ceremony can't take place. It has to happen here. Why can't it happen there? I don't know. Same with baptism. Why? They get, maybe it's back to that corporeality, the need for a physical body to do a physical ordinance. Okay? But for whatever reason, God has required that that be done here, whether in person or by proxy. But it has to happen in this life. The event has to happen in this life. But, what is, but that doesn't say anything about whether or not the status can or can't continue in the next life. As far as the Sadducees are concerned, nothing will continue in the next life. There isn't one. So why are we even talking about it? Good question. Why are you asking about it? Well, because we're trying to make that look like a logical impossibility. Okay. Well, let me clarify the difference. And in fact, let me use another example. Let's talk about death, shall we? Since that seems to be what you're fixated on. You want it to be permanent? Fine. But the way he said it in that Luke version, neither can they die anymore. So in... Let's put it this way. Death as an event versus death as a, as a status. And where does de death as the event take place? Well, it happens in this world. Because it's not going to happen in that, world, in that one. You will not die there. You'll die here. You will not get married there. You'll get married here. But that doesn't change the status. The, the, the state, the nature of the thing itself you see, there is a resurrection, and it will, make, it, will, it will make sure that death as an event only occurs in this life, and there will not be a permanent status of death in the next. When it comes to marriage, yes, marriage as an event has to happen in this life. But I'm glad you brought up the idea of permanent status. Just like life will be your permanent status in the resurrection, marriage will be your permanent status in the resurrection as well. Provided that you entered into that marriage with a wedding by proper authority here on earth. You understand the difference? I'm not sure if my friend was willing to hear that out. Oh, it's too complicated. If you're explaining, you're losing. Well, I think the scriptures deserve a little bit more thought 
than just surface level understanding. In fact, one thing I did point out to him, which was interesting, in section 132, which is the great revelation on eternal marriage, it includes the subset of plural marriage, but unfor and, that, and that unfortunately seems to take all the attention. But the bigger picture of eternal marriage, that's where it's described. That there doesn't have to be a till death do you part in an eternal, we in an eternal wedding. And if the event is right, then the permanent status will be right as well. But what amazes me about section 132 that clarifies that marriage is e meant to be eternal, guess what verse it mentions in the middle of that revelation? This one from Matthew 22. The one that supposedly makes eternal marriage an impossibility. And in the revelation on eternal marriage, they bring it up? That's odd. You'd think that if we miss that verse somehow, and we were blindsided by those that attack us with that text and say, see, there's no marriage in heaven. You'd think that we, we would try to avoid bringing it up. But oh no, we bring it straight in there. You think we're breaking the rule. Well, let's bring the so-called rule in, even as we're here in the midst of breaking it. How's that sound? That's like speeding while you're holding the speed limit side out, sign out the window as you breeze past the highway patrol. He's like, what? that's pretty bold. Uh, well, it's pretty bold of the Lord to mention this verse in section 132. By the way, he does the same thing about that verse at the end of Revelation. You can't add or take from the books of the, uh, the, the scriptures in the Bible. And guess what? That's, that warning is reproduced in section 20 of the Doctrine and Covenants. <laughs> The prohibition against adding is including in some of the scripture that we've so-called added. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, we're not being flippant. We're being thoughtful and trying to express to people, Joseph Smith didn't invent this doctrine out of ignorance of your so-called rule from the Bible. No, he understood it differently. And with a prophetic gift of scriptural interpretation, of course, he can see the truth and see how Scripture still fits that truth instead of your shallow misapplication of it. So here's the verse in section 132. It's verse 15 and 16. Therefore, if a man marry him a wife in this world, and that's the same kind of phrase that we saw in the Luke, the children of this world, they're the ones that can marry. Well, if a man marry him a wife in the world, and he marry her not by me nor by my word, so it wasn't done in the right way by the proper authority in the proper place. If he covenant with her so long as he is in the world and she with him, then their covenant and marriage are not of force when they are dead. And when they are out of the world, therefore they are not bound by any law when they are out of the world. Again, you see him comparing this world and the next world, in or out. Therefore, and now how's this for Matthew 22? When they are out of the world, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are appointed angels in heaven. And then he even clarifies what it means to be that kind of an angel, which angels are ministering servants to minister for those who are worthy of a far more and an exceeding and an eternal weight of glory. There it is, the so-called rule repeated in the very revelation that breaks that rule, or so people think. No, we just interpret that verse very differently. The wedding must take place here. If it does, then the permanent status of marriage will continue in the next life. And that to me is a glorious blessing. The fact that there is a next life at all is an incredible blessing as well. But that's one that the Sadducees deny from the start. It's actually there that Jesus comes back to that topic, since he knows that's really what they're after. <laughs> and, and Matthew and Luke and Mark are all trying to clarify that that's, that's what we should see in this too. So let's get back to that real question about resurrection. Uh, verse 31 and 32, back in, in Matthew chapter 22. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, since that's what you're really asking, isn't it? Have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. If you've read that, if you know that verse, then you'll know this too. 
that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. In the Mark version of this, he even sneaks in an extra affirmation of the doctrine. He says, and is touching the dead, that they rise. <laughs> Let me make that clear. Have ye not read in the books of Moses, how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, and then the same phrase, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. And then you'll see the same idea in Luke, chapter 20, verse 37 and 38. Now that the dead are raised, so he, there he is, confirming the doctrine from the very beginning all over again, bearing his testimony, that the dead are raised, even Moses showed. So you so-called experts in the law of Moses, you don't know your Moses very well. Moses showed that the dead are raised. He showed it at the bush. So both uh, Mark and Luke mentioned the burning bush as the source of this experience. And what did God say to Moses from the midst of the burning bush? He called the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And there it is again. He's a God not of the dead. He's a God of the living. For all live unto him. I mean, think about it. Otherwise, why would you bring up Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to Moses when by Moses' day, those guys are long gone? But for God to introduce himself to someone in the present by mentioning people in the past, but keeping it in the present tense, not I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they're gone, so their witness of me is gone too. My relationship with them is over. No, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am that I am. How's that for present tense and permanent tense? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are as alive and well to me as they ever were when they were on your side of the veil. They're on my side now. But that's even a more permanent condition than anything you guys experienced down there below. You understand? You know, the multitudes did. In Matthew 22, 33, when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine all over again. Or in the Luke version, then certain of the scribes answering said, oh, master, thou hast well said. So even the scribes are convinced, like, oh, he's, you got a good point there. We do know our Bible. We do know our Moses. And Moses, okay, that, yep, that's present tense. And leverant marriage and eternal marriage. Okay, I guess there is a difference. This world, that world. That was an imp you got out, you got away. You got out of that pretty impressively. Lord, I'm, I'm amazed. And after that, Luke says, they durst not ask him any question at all. I mean, he'd showed them up. He'd finally put them to silence. And they're waving the white flag. Well, not entirely. <laughs> that was the second question that they tried to trap Jesus with. It didn't work, and some people shut up after that. But there was uh, still the group of holdouts that thought, mm, let's go third time's the charm. And it'll end up being three strikes and they're out. But here's their third question. Matthew chapter 22. Yeah, Mark will bring up the same question, by the way. But in verse 34, when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, and they were probably excited about that because the Pharisees didn't like the Sadducees and the Sadducees didn't like the Pharisees back. But they both agreed on one thing. We've got to put an end to Jesus. Well, the Pharisees said, fine, tag out, uh, tap out, and I'll come in and take your place. Now, these Pharisees are gathered together. There's the strength in numbers. Uh, anybody got a good idea that hasn't been used yet? And one of them thought of something. One of them, which was a lawyer. So here's an expert in the law of Moses, a, a scribe we typically call them in Scripture. He asked Jesus a question, tempting him, so we know his motive from the start, and saying, Master, there it is again, which is the great commandment in the law? Hmm, which one? Let's just have you pick one, because that's the great thing about trying to pick the greatest of anything. Any goat conversation, what's the greatest of all time, will lead to a debate. It will lead to arguments. And there's so many different criteria that go into things of like, well, what are you measuring them by? Greatest in terms of accomplishments? Greatest in terms of skill? Maybe they were amazing, but on a bad team. There's so many, or, or what, what skill set are you talking about? Offense, defense, what's the sport? This is, no wonder there's so many debate shows that that wrestle over goat questions. And now, what's the greatest commandment of all time? What's the most important to keep? Was he trying to tempt Jesus into selective obedience, or at least the chance to accuse him of that? Uh, because whatever he doesn't pick, 
can be used against him. Oh, Jesus said that this, you know, that commandment A is the most important. So what, he doesn't care about commandment B? This is exactly what they were doing with the woman taken in adultery. As usual, we're going to pit him against himself and make it so there's no good way out. Now, we also saw, as I, as I mentioned, that we know from the get-go the, the reasoning behind this question. I got an idea. I know how to tempt Jesus when everyone else has failed up to this point. It's important that we come to understand why people are asking their questions. I deal with questions constantly as people struggling in their faith or interfaith conversations or whatever it might be, anti-Mormonism, you name it. And I have realized how important it is to do what Jesus is doing here. What's the purpose behind the, the question? What are you, why, not just what are you asking, that's important, but why are you asking it? Now, we don't have to say that combatively, like, why do you want to know? But if we're calm and open and listen, you can typically tell what's behind the question. And I have sometimes had to end conversations with people by asking them a question of my own about their questions. I'll usually say, are you asking questions because you want answers? Or are you asking questions because you want me to have questions? If it's the first, I could do this all day. I believe wholeheartedly in the answers of the restored gospel. And if you want those answers, let me give you a chance, give me a chance to give them to you. On the other hand, if you're asking me questions because you want me to have questions, then I think we're done. Because I don't have those questions. And I won't let you force yours upon me. I have responded to those adequately in my own mind and heart. The Lord has confirmed those things to me. And so I think we're done here. And usually they'll agree. And we'll part ways amicably. And agree to disagree without becoming disagreeable. Well, in a way, Jesus is perceiving that in this lawyer. You're not asking for a good reason. But I can still answer this one. And I'll do it in a way that you cannot accuse me of not taking seriously any of the commandments that I don't mention in the list. It's amazing how he's going to do that. And here's how he does it. Verse 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And he could have added to this lawyer, instead of using your God-given mind to look for legal loopholes or try to make someone an offender for a word. Uh, just saying. Anyway, this is the first and great commandment. But don't stop there. There is another one. The second is like unto it. So this is a close second, very similar to the first. And what's the second great commandment? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then just in case you think I'm being limiting and focusing only on love of God and love of neighbor in some kind of narrowly defined way, oh no, this is as broad as it comes. Jesus says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Oh, the whole, everything you see in your precious Hebrew Bible, the law, the Torah, the prophets, the writings, you name it, it can all be boiled down to those two things. Now, later Jewish writers would come up with a list of every do and don't do in the, in the, in the Hebrew Bible, and they came up with 613 things. That's quite the list. As far as Jesus is concerned, let's not overcomplicate things. Let's take the 613 and reduce them down to two. Love God, love neighbor. In fact, I guess you could reduce those down to one. Love. As long as it's the right kind of love. The pure love of Christ. Charity. The kind that suffereth long and is kind. The kind that is not puffed up and envieth not. The kind that doesn't rejoice in iniquity and thinketh no evil. The kind that Jesus embodied and personified. That's the commandment. It can all be reduced down to that. Now, what Jesus is describing here is, it's one of my favorite passages because it's so simple. Living it isn't always simple. Uh, but to see it through that, in that perspective, just love God and love your neighbor. And I'll add to that, love thy neighbor as thyself suggests that there is self-love here too. But even that is a pure love and seeing yourself the way Christ sees you, okay? 
We saw some of that when we started this week with Zacchaeus. There's some pure love as far as how Jesus saw him and how he hoped Zacchaeus would see himself and see others around him. But to love others, to love self, to love God, that's what Jesus came to exemplify. And to me, that in its simplest form is the cross of Christ. There is a vertical post you stick in the ground. There is a horizontal cross beam you attach to that. And one is the vertical and the other is the horizontal. And those are the two great commandments. The first is the one you sit in the ground. It's the larger of the two, the longer. It's the one that points us heavenward and directs our love to God. All our heart, all our might, all our mind, all our strength, give it to Him, consecrate, and live your life with God at the helm. Purify your motives. Do it for pure love of Him. And there's, I don't know if there's any commandments you'd end up breaking. Maybe you could have just left it at that. But in case people don't know how to prove contraries, let's, let's give you a contrary to prove and add the horizontal to the vertical. Because there might be some who are so caught up in what they consider their love of God that it grows so narrow it doesn't bless anyone but them. And that's a problem. So we need to extend things outward and add a horizontal crossbeam. Otherwise, your discipleship is, is far too narrow. It doesn't bless those around you. Then again, if you're all horizontal and no vertical, then your love of others does not lift them very high off the ground. This is one of my favorite contraries to prove. Uh, when I think of the scripture of taking up the cross daily, these are the two commandments I think of. And as we begin our day in daily devotion to God, I am setting that vertical post in the ground, and it is lifting my heart and mind to heaven. It's with that love of God within me that then I can look out and reach out horizontally to those around me and lift them off the ground as well. I can bring them closer to God. You see that? That's taking up the cross daily. If you want to see a chart, <laughs> since we seem to like those, look at this one as far as love of God and love of neighbor side by side. These two great commandments, the, the vertical and the horizontal. Love of God, that's being spiritual. Love of neighbor, that's being religious. I hear so many people these days saying, oh, I'm spiritual, not religious. And I go, oh, that's unfortunate. You're just a post in the ground. There's no cross for Christ to hold to, to bring others toward him. We need the structure, the organization of the church so that we can reach out and serve others in powerful ways. In fact, that's another line on our chart. On the love God side is transcendence, just connecting to him above us, beyond us. But love neighbor, that's the service side. That's where the rubber hits the road. <laughs> I've got some dirt under my fingernails because I'm reaching out to people that I can love and lift. On the love God side, there's learn the gospel. On the love neighbor side, there's live the gospel. Those don't have to be mutually exclusive. I hope we know that. Or how about this? On the vertical, there's Christ the bridegroom, and on the horizontal, there's the church, the bride. And that's a marriage that's meant to be eternal. When I look at the vertical, I feel my batteries recharging. And when I look to the horizontal, I feel my batteries discharging. All the strength and grace that God has given me, I can then discharge it on those around me and hopefully increase their chance to connect with heaven themselves. Clayton Christensen gave a great message once where he talked about why he believes and why he belongs. And even those can be placed side by side on this chart. Why I believe is the vertical. It's my love of God. But why I belong is the horizontal, my love of neighbor. My belonging in the church gives me so many opportunities to reach out in love to those around me. Or even that great verse in section one of the Doctrine and Covenants, when the church is described as true and living, even there, I see this contrary. And because the church is true, there's the vertical. It connects us to God. But because the church is living, oh, it reaches out and helps all those within its redeeming reach. I remember hearing once about President Monson, that he was like a pine tree 
tall and pointing to heaven, but also with branches that were low and broad to reach out to everyone around him. Well, if he were to take the, the rough sketch of the Christmas tree and have that vertical and then that horizontal, I'll get rid of most of the, the greenery. And what shape are you left with? Flip it upside down, and once again, you have the cross of Christ. I pray that we may take up that cross daily. And that like this lawyer trying to tempt Jesus, we can get an answer that, that saves us from that kind of temptation. Why are we doing what we're doing? Is it motivated by the pure love of Christ? Vertical, horizontal, best of all, both. Now, William Blake put it beautifully. We are put on earth a little space that we may learn to bear the beams of love. That's the cross. Now, in the Mark account of this, the lawyer isn't as much of a bad guy as he is in Matthew's account. Again, if Matthew's writing to Jews, perhaps he's trying to wean his fellow Jews off the Jewish leadership. So don't be like this guy that's trying to tempt and make Jesus an offender for a word. Don't do that. Be better than this. But in the Mark version, the man himself is better than that too. And Jesus knows it. Mark 12, verse 28, one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well. So maybe he's one of those that's like, man, Jesus always seems to know just the right thing to say to these people. Well, he has a question. And again, I don't know if he's tempting him. It, it doesn't say that here in Mark. Maybe he has an honest question. This man, Jesus, seems to know how to answer everything. Well, maybe he can answer mine. And the question, again, is like what we saw in Matthew. Which is the first commandment of all? Maybe he's like the rich young ruler, wanting to know, what thing do I lack? Is there something that I should be doing more than anything else? And Jesus answered him. The first of all the commandments is... And then notice how he changes it, in, or how he completes it, I should say, in the, in the Mark version. Here's the first of all the commandments. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, wait, was there a commandment in there? Well, no, no, not yet. But that's the introduction to the first great commandment, which then follows, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. As Jesus clarifies, this is the first commandment. What I love about Mark's account of this is it makes it more obvious that Jesus is quoting the Shema. The, one of the most important prayers in all of Jewish tradition is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. There's a few more verses beyond it that Jews will continue to quote. But this is, this is what they say morning and night. And for them to be able to begin their day and end it, talk about taking up the cross daily, by saying, the Lord our God is one Lord. It's only him. So it's only his opinion that matters. It's only his commandments that we must obey. And what's the first one they list? Love that Lord, the only one that there is, with all your heart, might, mind, and strength. Jesus is not making this up as some kind of New Testament doctrine. No, this is as old as it gets. And so drawing upon the Old Testament and folding the entire law and prophets into the Shema, hear. That's what Shema means. Just hear God. He wants you to love him. And boy, does he love you. And then Jesus says, the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And in case we don't know our Old Testament well enough to recognize the Shema in the first great commandment, if we don't see Deuteronomy there, then we might miss Leviticus in the second one. That's good Old Testament doctrine too. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself is Leviticus 19, 18. And just to make sure you know who it's coming from, he then clarifies, I am the Lord, as he always does in the book of Leviticus. There is none other commandment, Jesus says, greater than these. That's powerful. This is the Lord of the New Testament, who was also the God of the Old Testament. And he knows those words like the back of his hand. He inspired them in the first place. And how does this lawyer respond? In Matthew, we don't see. In Matthew, it jumps straight back to the group that he was a part of, and they're all grumbling and like, ah, oh, he got out, he got away from us again. How does he keep doing this? 
But in the mark, which is more gentle, the mark that allows for the possibility of this man being sincere and honest in his seeking, I do love his immediate response. Mark 12, verse 32. The scribe said unto him, Well, master. And maybe he meant it that time. Well, master, thou hast said the truth. For there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength. By the way, I love that he doesn't say might. He uses understanding. This is your, your knowledge, your wisdom. Do you get it? Are you following him with eyes wide open, heart wide open? Do you understand what you're doing instead of just kind of rote memorization, falling lockstep into line? No. Do you love him with your understanding? And to love his neighbor as himself, he goes on, is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And that's amazing that this scribe would say that. A scribe elevating an attribute over an action? That's unheard of. For him to emphasize the inward even more than the outward. I mean, we're used to seeing Jesus do that. He's the one that always quoted Hosea, that more important than your sacrifices would be mercy. Why don't you try that for a while? And this scribe, I was cut from similar cloth. Oh, Jesus, you're right. Good point. He's either been com completely converted through the Lord's incredible answer. Maybe he started trying to tempt Jesus, and by the end he's like, wow, okay, I was in the wrong, and you're in the right. You have well said. Or maybe he was sincere from the start, and now he's just even more convinced by the end. I've always thought that. And yet here I am, surrounded by others, other experts in the law, other lawyers, other Pharisees that are sticklers on every jot and tittle, and I always, I mean, they're so convincing. I've, I've kind of started going that way, but down deep, I've always worried, are we getting caught up in the thick of thin things? Are we focusing so much on outward actions that we've missed the point of inner attributes? Jesus, your comment comes like a breath of fresh air. The wind of the Spirit blowing to push away the fog. Thank you for that. And then Jesus, I love this. When Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, and other translations say wisely or prudently, the Greek literally means in a mind-having way. That's such, such a great phrase. When Jesus saw that he answered in a mind-having way. It's like you do focus on understanding, don't you? You really get it, don't you? Then Jesus said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Like, oh, you are so close. That's why this man reminds me of the rich young ruler so much. One thing thou lackest. You are not far from the kingdom of God. In fact, <laughs> oh, its king is standing right in front, in front of you. You want to join? Want to follow me? Well, from that point, no man after that durst ask him any question. And that really is the end of their interrogations. Uh, depending on who you're asking, they stop asking their questions at different points. Some gave up a little earlier. Some, well, let's try this other one. This, this one we're probably going to get them. The Pharisees had their best shot. The Sadducees had their best shot. This lawyer comes out thinking, well, maybe this will get them. Or maybe this is something I really want to know. But by now, after the three parables of those who lost out, and after the three questions that Jesus could not be tripped up with. It's, it's, it's time to change tactics as far as his enemies are concerned. And we're going to go from intellectual assaults in hopes that we can make him an offender for a word to much more physical ones because there's going to be no getting out of those ones. He will not t talk himself down from the cross. So keep your eye out for what they're about to, how they're, how they're about to change their approach. But before they leave, one other thing. This is Matthew 22, 41. When the Pharisees were gathered together, Mark says that all of this is still happening at the temple, by the way. So sacred precincts, despite some not so sacred conversations. While they were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, and what a question. It's going to tri trip them up. 
like he asked about the John the Baptist authority before. But the way he phrases it from the start is such a beautiful, profound question on a more broader scale. It's five words. What think ye of Christ? So much of our response to his teachings will boil down to how we answer that five word question. What do we think of Jesus? What think we of Christ? Now, Jesus had a more specific thought in mind. This is where he's turning the tables on them and asking them to, ask, to answer a question that they couldn't. He could, the two can play that game, right? We already saw that. But when he asks, what think ye of Christ? He then follows up with another question. Whose son is he? Now, he knows his Jewish audience is going to have a clear answer, and he gets the one that he expects. They say unto him, the son of David. Well done. Yes, you know your Old Testament. You know your Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The Messiah will come as an heir to the Davidic throne. <laughs> but then Jesus takes their answer and turns it right back on them. Verse 43. He saith unto them, Okay, good. Well done. How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. In Luke, he's even more specific. Uh, speaking to a Gentile audience, he's got to clarify himself. He says, David himself saith in the book of Psalms, and then he quotes that same text. It's Psalm 110, verse 1. And that's the question he's getting at. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? If David's looking up to his Lord, and yet that Lord is the son of David, wouldn't he look down, forward, onward to him? How's that work? You see, Jesus has just pulled off the ultimate Old Testament-based chicken and egg dilemma. Which one came first? The Lord or the Lord? If David is the Lord on the throne, but he's only there because the Lord allows him to be, but then the Lord, the Messiah, is going to come from the house of David. So who started this thing? <laughs> does the Lord come from David or does David come from the Lord? What say ye? <laughs> what think ye of Christ? And just like with the John the Baptist question, they're speechless. They're waving white flags. They have nothing to say in response. In verse 46, no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. And then Mark adds this detail. And the common people heard him gladly, which I just laugh. It's like they're eating this up. They're loving this. And they're, they're, they're spectators, and they're watching these verbal pyrotechnics, and the scribes will come, and they'll ask him, then like, ooh, how's he going to get out of that one? And he gets out perfectly. They're like, oh, whoa, that was amazing. Then the Sadducees come out, like, well, what about this? And they're like, ooh, that's a great question. And he's all, oh, but really, what is the question? Let's go with that. And they're like, ooh, two for two. And then this guy comes, and which is the great commandment? And they're like, ooh, 613 to choose from. What's he going to pick? And he says, how about all of them? But boil down to these two. And they're like, this guy's amazing. And even the lawyer knows that. And then Jesus says, my turn. And ask that question. And the people are just, man, this guy's amazing. I wish people still had the guts to ask him those kinds of questions. Or that he would have, that he would want to keep pursuing that line of thought. And I mean, nobody's going to beat Jesus. And, and the people love him for it. I do too. Now, Mark 12 and Luke 20, which reflect what we've been studying this week in Matthew 21 and 22, then end with really short account of some chastisement that the Lord gives to the scribes and Pharisees. He's finally silenced them, and now that they're, if, if you'll just shut your mouth and hopefully keep your ears open, maybe I can get a word in edgewise. Maybe you've been humbled or humiliated, take your pick, to the point that you might be willing to, to listen to a few calls to repent. And so he gives them a few of those calls. In both Mark and Luke, it starts with the phrase, beware of the scribes. Maybe they've already taken off, and it's just other disciples, these people that, loved, that love him and are stoked to just to watch the conversations unfold. Maybe it's just them, and Jesus is warning them, beware of the scribes, those people that just hightailed it off the Temple Mount with tail between their legs. Mark then gives three verses to what they need to beware of, and Luke gives them only two. 
Matthew, meanwhile, unloads an entire chapter on them. Over 30 verses of things to beware as they beware the scribes. Figures, again, that Matthew would be the one to do it, since he is warning the Jews against their own types of thinking, their own approaches to stuff, their, their own leadership. He's a good husbandman, <laughs> warning his fellow husbandmen, we got to be true to the householder. Okay, So Matthew 23 is where we see this, and it's in some ways a brutal chapter. It's the most scathing rebuke you're going to see from Jesus. Well, I guess there was the one in John where he's like, yeah, you're of, I'm of my father, God. You're of your father, the devil. How's that? Well, Matthew 23 is going to be Matthew's version. It's the, it's the biggest point in the synoptic gospels of Jesus giving a verbal tongue lashing. And speaking of lashing, he just cleansed the temple physically yesterday. Today, he is cleansing the temple rhetorically and crying repentance by calling out the scribes and the Pharisees for the kinds of things that they are guilty of. And it's quite the list. He's going to start pretty broadly in chapter 23, verse 1 to 3. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. If this were the Book of Mormon, you could call it the judgment seat. But it's the same idea. It's called Moses' seat here because Moses was the great lawgiver. And who's taken his place by now? Well, if we're being literal, it would be Jesus, right? A prophet like unto Moses would someday come. Well, he's come. He's right there. But as far as the regular Jews are concerned, it's those scribes and Pharisees. They're the ones that are, are the modern Moses and sticklers for his law and interpreting everything about it and, and extending its parameters to, to increase the oral law that protects the written law. It's those scribes and Pharisees. They're the ones that are running the show. And notice what Jesus says about them. He starts in a fascinating way. He says, All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. And with that, we're getting a nod toward the hypocrisy that he's going to call out much more specifically in just a moment. But I love that he's differentiating between what people say and what people do. These Pharisees may say a lot of good things. They're quoting scripture left and right. But by their fruits, you shall know them. And notice the fruits of their lives. Are they helping people be healed and free on the Sabbath? No, they're making it a day of don'ts rather than a day of do's. Are they lifting and helping and serving and saving? No, they're judging and condemning. So don't do what they do. Now that part's easy. Don't follow the bad example of the Pharisees. But the first part is strange. What they say, what they bid you observe, yes, then you better observe and do. Now wait a minute. Why would we do that? They have no authority. It's your authority. They, they're usurpers of Moses' seat. You are Moses 2.0. I know. But if I'm not here to overthrow Roman rule, I'm not here to overthrow Jewish rule either. That's, both of those are going to take care of themselves. The Romans will overthrow the Jews. And then later the Gentiles will overthrow the Romans. So they'll get what's coming. God can afford to be patient and play the long game. But in the meantime, my dear saints, you are living under other authorities. And Please don't take this too far. There will be times where you do have to decide God or mammon, Christ or Caesar. But in many things in the day-to-day -day of life, you do need to render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And in this case, render unto the Pharisees what the Pharisees are demanding. If this is the Sanhedrin, then they do kind of run the day-to-day -day affairs. And someone like me can, yeah, push against them. I'm trying to fix the system, but the system is there. And unless you want to join me on the cross, then you might have to do the things that the Pharisees command of you. 
I think in some ways Jesus is differentiating between the person and the position, as we see in who's in Moses's seat. That's the bishop's office. That's the, the president. That's the Oval Office. That, that's the where the president sits. In this case, this is the lawgiver, and the Sanhedrin is your lawgiver, and so you better follow what they say. Don't do what they do, but keep the rules. Keep their commandments, and if those commandments need to change, as I've been trying to change them, then try to work within the system. Try to be patient until I come to right every wrong. I, I had an email a while ago from an old student of mine, amazing young man as a teenager, and he's just been getting better and better ever since. He's now a high school teacher himself, which I just love because he was such a good high school student. He, he gets them. And he asked me about this verse. I haven't had time to respond to him. Sorry. So this is my chance. <laughs> but he brought up a fascinating thought about this passage. And again, it boils down to difference between person and position. And if the position is there, we have to, we have to honor the position, don't we? And again, to, there's a, a limit to that. Uh, if it gets to a point where you, there has to be conscious, conscientious objection, then, then so be it. DNC 134 would even allow for that. A you know, great revelation on how the church works with the state, even though keeping them separate. But this great old student of mine was saying, I wonder if this would be helpful for people that are struggling in their faith, that wonder about oh, policies that are coming down from Moses' seat in our day or statements that were made by past prophets that have left people scratching their heads and wondering. And what he suggested, which I thought was very wise, was recognizing that even Jesus here, though not in support of the person, is in support of the position. There's a reason that Moses' seat exists. Someday it will be Jesus himself sitting there. Until then, we're left with mere mortals that hopefully are doing the best that they can. But their own humanity may sometimes get in the way. The Lord, like I said, has his way of fixing things. Whether that's sending the Roman legion in 70 AD to remove this Jewish leadership. Whether it's a revelation being sent to Spencer W. Kimball in 1978 extending the reach of the priesthood and its blessings. Our oh, patience and faith is what we're all called upon to exhibit whenever a mere mortal is occupying Moses' seat. I will support the president even if I don't agree with him. I will keep the laws even though, even if my candidate isn't in the Congress. I will follow policy and doctrine as explained by prophets, seers, and revelators. And again, in our day, I'm, I'm so grateful for who occupies Moses' seat. The Lord has created, or government has created checks and balances to help us navigate that Moses' seat, Caesar's seat. But there's even checks and balances in the kingdom of God because there are presiding councils and a call on the Lord's part, this is DNC 107, to make their decisions in perfect unanimity. Many of the tricky parts of church history came before the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve completely wrapped their hearts and minds around the call for unanimity. I would love to see Brigham Young and Orson Pratt locked together in a room and told you're not allowed to come out until you completely agree with one another. That's going to take a while. But I think the history of the church would have been different. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to be careful here, and, and I hope you understand where my heart is in absolute loyalty to those in Moses' seat in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm so grateful for prophets, seers, and revelators. I'm glad that they're sitting there, and I'm not. My seat is much more comfortable than those big red ones. But to see in all patience and faith as section 21 tells us, that is going to require honoring those in the seat of Moses. 
and trusting that they're doing the best they can and trusting that the Lord is there to lead them. Thank you, my good friend, for bringing that verse to my attention. I do think it's something powerful. I think it can help us navigate things yeah, from the past or from the present. And I do think it'll be up to us also to exercise our own gift of discernment to know if it ever comes to a point, as it did with the ancient Sanhedrin, when they're, they're, it's not the judgment seat that they're sitting on, but some kind of throne for a self-righteous and self-appointed king. That's not what we have in, in the modern church. It does seem to be a problem at, at times among the, the ancient leadership. And then Jesus is going to spend the rest of this chapter basically calling out specific examples of do not do as the scribes and Pharisees. <laughs> because I'll tell you what they're doing. You just stick with the words that they give and do your best to live the law. But here's the first example. Verse 4. They bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. I mean, that might get some dirt under my fingernails. I, I, I might pull a muscle. Of, of course not. I'm in charge here, which means I have people to do those things. And those people probably have people of their own. I'm so far removed from heavy burdens. I don't do that kind of lifting. Remember when Jesus said, oh, that's Gentile leadership. That's the way they do it. Well, I guess here it's Jewish leadership too, unfortunately. But that's not how Jesus came. He came to be a true servant leader. And he that would be chief among you, let him be servant of all. Let him do the heavy lifting. The scribes and Pharisees weren't that way. Or how about verse 5 through 7? But all their works they do for to be seen of men. And then he gives a bunch of examples. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets to be called of men. Rabbi, Rabbi. Oh, it's music to their ears. Now, Jesus just summarized a lot of the things that he'd said earlier in the Sermon on the Mount. Are you praying on the street corner to be seen of man? Well, your leaders are. Are you disfiguring your face so people see how pious you are? Well, they are. Oh, even these phylacteries, these tefillim, these boxes with little prayers on tiny little scrolls that they would put in there and then wear on their foreheads, keep it on your mind at all times, or on their arm to keep it close to the heart. Well, all the Jews were doing that, but oh, if I want to stand out from among my brethren then let's make sure that my phylactery is big enough for all to see. I mean, you may have written a little bit of God's Word on there to keep on the mind and the heart. Well, I could practically fit the whole Old Testament. Wow, you must be holier than all of us. Or the fringe of their, the border of their garment, those fringes, those tassels that reminded them of their Jewish identity. Well, I'm a Jew's Jew. I'm, I'm bigger and better than the rest. And so let's make this as visible as we can get. Uh, the uppermost room, again, we're back to that best seat in the house. And don't automatically assume it's for you. There's probably somebody better waiting in the wings. But it's that last one that I, that I love the most. Rabbi, Rabbi. And what do people call you? Honestly, it's one of the things that rubs me the wrong way. Now that I finally have my PhD, I can't stand it when people call me Dr. Halverson. It sounds so, I don't know. I mean, if that's your title, I know you paid a price. It takes a ton of work to get there. Believe me, I get it. It took me forever. But so I mean, it's not a problem if that's what you go by and, and people will use that honorific. But to demand it, I don't know. To just, it, ah, I was in a, in a class recently, I was just guest lecturing, and they're like, uh, and now we have Dr. Halverson? Is that, is that what you'd like to be called? And I just laugh and I'm all, no way. It's just bro Hal. That's me. Just bro Hal. And the students kind of giggled, like, is he serious? I'm like, yeah, just bro Hal. Jared seems a little too uh, close for a teacher-student relationship, but Dr. Halverson sounds way too far. So, Brother Halverson is just fine. Or bro Hal, for short, does me just fine. Now, he's going to continue on that in verse 8 uh, through 10. He says, But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. So there's equality between us mere mortals. We're all infinitely beneath him. 
which puts all of us on the exact same level, relatively speaking. He says, call no man your father upon the earth. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> no, you can do that one. But for one is your father, capital F, which is in heaven. Another example, neither be ye called masters. I'm so tired of you guys calling me master uh, hypocritically and insincerely. So don't call each other masters. For one is your master, even Christ. And the irony there is even Christ himself wasn't demanding to be called rabbi or master or father or anything else. Instead, what did he spend his time doing? Anytime anybody did say anything good about him? Oh, why call ye me good? There's only one good, and that's the father. I only do those things I've seen him do. So, Father, all the glory be thine. I'm not trying to take any mortal spotlights, even though I happen to be the light of the world. I guess if he's the light of the world. <laughs> a spotlight on him wouldn't do any good anyway, right? But he's glorifying his Father in, in heaven, as should we. My uncle Mike once said, and I love this one, that when you're being introduced as a speaker somewhere, he said it makes him uncomfortable to have these long, drawn-out introductions. And the way he puts it is, it only took seven words for the Father to introduce the Son. This is my beloved Son, hear Him. That's it. So anything more than seven words for a mere mortal seems like overkill. <laughs> then again, Jesus needed no introduction, but got one. The rest of us, why would anybody care to listen to us? Maybe some introduction is needed, but not the kind of mortal praise that see, people seem to, to fawn over. Next one, verse 11 and 12. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Now we're back to that servant leadership that Jesus exemplified. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Back to the role reversal we've come to expect in Christ's teachings. Verse 13, but woe unto you. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, exclamation point. Get used to that, because he's going to start so many of these calls to repent with that exact phrase. The woes here, I think there's eight of them, go along. In some ways, they're the opposite of the Beatitudes way back at the Sermon on the Mount. As Jesus is beginning his ministry, blessed are ye of this, and blessed that, and blessed this. And here at the end, it's woe unto you if this, and woe unto you for that. Well, do you want to be the blessed of the Beatitudes, or do you want to be the woes of the hypocrites in Matthew 23? Choice is ours. But here's the first one that we get. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. In other words, it's bad enough that you're not living worthy of the kingdom, but to keep other people from coming in, Ah, oh, that's just beneath you, even you. Not only are you so far from perfection, that's why I told the people, don't do what you do, but you make living the gospel so burdensome. There's the heavy burdens. Talk about, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Yours is crushing. It's, <laughs> there's no way anybody can live up to it. So no wonder they feel perpetually unworthy and unloved. No, no wonder they don't think that anyone's invited into the kingdom. Whatever, I'll take the lame and the blind and the maimed and the halt. Come to the wedding feast. I want to celebrate with you. I'll bring the publicans and the sinners and the harlots and everyone that's willing to heed my call to come. But you Pharisees make obedience seem so unreachable. And why do people even try at all? You're either forcing them into the same level of hypocrisy that you're guilty of. Or if it's not hypocrisy, then it's hopelessness. And then they'll just give up. We cannot allow ourselves to follow that bad example. We need to reverse both of them. Live in such a way that we can enter the kingdom of God through the grace of Christ. But also teach the gospel with enough hopefulness enough mercy and grace that everyone else knows that they can come to. And once they know, they'll come running. How about verse 14 and 15? Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. We've seen already how Jesus feels about widows. 
raising the son of the widow of Nain, for example, helping those that are struggling, the society's lowest levels, and yet these Jewish leaders are devouring widows' houses. A little bit later, we'll do it next week, we'll see Jesus compare poor widows to rich Pharisees. And it's the Pharisees that come out looking, looking bad. A pretense, long prayer, just drag it out, drone onward and onward. Well, I guess if you're just praying to yourself, like the Pharisee in the parable, then you, know, you love listening to yourself. You can go do this all day. Or another one, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Ooh, that's strong language. Make one proselyte, a convert to Judaism, but to the Pharisaic branch of it. Let's make you sticklers just like we are. Well, you've left them worse, not better. You do everything in your power to convince them. Compass, sea, and land. You go everywhere. That's, that's a diligent missionary if I've ever, ever seen one. But their conversion is more like a deconversion. Because coming unto you is the opposite of coming unto Christ. You're leading them in the wrong direction. I would hate for anyone to follow me if by doing so, they're alienating themselves from God. I, I want to move people in a better direction, not a worse one. But the Pharisees were guilty of moving them in, in the worst way. He then says in verse 16, Woe unto you, ye blind guides. And this is going to be the blind leading the blind. Or maybe even worse, the blind forcing the sighted to follow them. You blind guides, you have no idea where you're going. And then this is the example that he uses. You blind guides which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, ah, it's nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, oh, he's a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. Think about that. Can you be wise-minded there? Or how about this example? That you say, Whosoever shall swear by the altar, ah, that is nothing. Oh, but whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Again, ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. You see, these Pharisees are focusing on the trees, but they're totally missing the forest. Like I said before, getting caught up in the thick of thin things. What do you swear by? Cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. Oh, I'd, I'd bet, what, what would you bet on it? Yeah, if I'm supposed to take your word, I mean, this goes back to the Sermon on the Mount too. Why do you have to swear by anything? Just let your yay mean yay and your nay mean nay and let your word be your bond. Be a person of integrity. Oh, no, no, no. We have to have things signed and notarized and put in triplicate and I can sue you if you don't follow through with your word. That's the problem. But here, what are they basing their word on. Oh, I, I'd swear by all the gold of the Queen of Sheba. I swear by everything in Fort Knox. What these Jews are saying, I swear by the gold of the temple. And that's, uh, there's a massive treasury there. And he's like, really? Is that, is that what the temple has been reduced to in your mind? Just a, a treasury? It's the temple itself that matters. And he who Rules and reigns there. Man, there's more cleaning up to do than I realized. I swear by all the sacrifice that is placed upon the altar. It's not the sacrifice that matters. It's the altar and him who sanctifies it. You guys really don't get it, do you? You don't even know. You, you have the temple. Yes, you're trusting in lying words. You have the temple, but you take it for granted. You think it's just a place to store the money and to, to oh, <laughs> sacrifice a, a token sheep now and then? Is really that, that's all it is to you? Do you not see God behind it all? Because it's the temple that matters. It's the altar that matters. It's your own worthiness, own obedience and sacrifice. It's your integrity. It's clean hands and a pure heart. They're the ones that ascend into the hill of the Lord. So, so swear by that. 
swear by your relationship with God that if I'm not being true, then I will sever my relationship with Him. Well, that's exactly what not being true does. That's spiritual death. And unfortunately, you're already guilty of it. He adds to that in verse 20 through 22. Whosoever therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereon. Do you not see the big picture? Don't be so myopic. Don't you know, don't you recognize that it's God behind it all? And it's his all-seeing eye, his perfect judgment and justice that will weigh you in the balance and see if you're found wanting. Take this stuff seriously, because it's serious. In verse 23, then one of the best of, of them all in this chapter. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. That's a fascinating passage. What he's seen, again, they're so focused on the tiny, tiny things that don't matter as much as the big things. You are making sure your 10% comes in from your mint, your anise, your cumin. I mean, it's one thing to count up the, the leaves of mint and then take the 10%, but cumin? How are you going to do that? Oh, no, we want to make sure every little particle comes the, the Lord's way. Well, is it the Lord's way or is it your way? Is it... Is it the temple or the temple treasury? The altar or the sacrifices thereon? No, you've reduced discipleship down to those kinds of pennies. And what have you neglected, omitted in the, in the, in the meantime? The weightier matters. And the weightier matters he lists are these divine attributes. No wonder he loves Hosea that I would have mercy, not sacrifice. I would have judgment and mercy and faith. I don't care about your mint and your anise and your cumin. Well, actually, I do a little, but only a little. You see, here's the interesting thing. He's Jesus, a master of proving contraries as always. He's correcting without overcorrecting. And that's our problem. Usually, we, usually when we correct, we overcorrect. And if I was doing something wrong in one direction, then I fix it by doing something wrong in the opposite direction. And it's like, oh, we, we weren't supposed to be tithing mint and anise and cumin. Okay, we're supposed to only work on judgment and mercy and faith. Okay, great, we'll do that. Forget the letter of the law. We're just supposed to be working on the spirit of the law, right? He's like, no, 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 work on both. Can, can you not do both? Can you hold them together in an act of tension? Because I love the way he ends it. These, these big things, these weighty things, divine Christ-like attributes, you've got to do those. You ought to have done them. But... You shouldn't leave the other things undone. That's really beautiful. When he says to be more like Mary, he's not saying to be less like Martha. No, it's got to be time specific, situation specific. And there's times where you're going to have, a turn, have to turn a blind eye on the mint because you're focused on mercy. But there's times that Someone needs to know that an honest tithe, even on your cumin, is part of your covenant with Christ. It's amazing that Jesus is trying to honor both, the big and the small. See the forest and the trees. Don't lose sight of either, either side of it. Well, losing sight is the problem they've already fallen to. Verse 24, ye blind guides. And then another very famous description of their blindness, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. <laughs> I mean, a picture, this would be a fun one to act out if you had a big enough bowl. Uh, it's one thing to have a cup and have a little gnat in it. And it's just there on the top, just kind of floating. You're like, yeah, I don't want to. 
on my mission, this would happen all the time. I'd be dying out there and I'd ask for a cup, a glass of water and they'd give it to me, but there'd be like, I don't know if the thing wasn't washed well, or there were some floaties. And I learned, I, I couldn't deny it because they knew how desperately I'd wanted the water. I'd asked and they were kind enough to give, uh, but I put it to my lips and I learned that if you exhale slowly through your nose, it blows the floaties to the other side of the cup. <laughs> And yeah, that's why you got to do it slow or you'll add floaties of your own. But then you can drink and just sip in, breathe out, sip in, breathe out, and the water comes forward and the floaties float away. Genius. Well, imagine doing that with a gnat. And you're just, oh, I can't do that. Let's strain it out. Let's make sure there's no tiny impurity there. No mint or anise or cumin that's been misplaced. Because especially if you're living the kosher laws as a good practicing Jew, especially an ultra-practicing, ultra-Jew, like a scribe or Pharisee, then we couldn't be caught with some unclean animal within us. It's against the word of wisdom, okay? So uh, I, don't, I don't want even a, a particle, a speck. Let's get rid of the gnats. Okay, that's fine, but the irony is, <laughs> what, <laughs> I don't know what the bigger problem is. Actually, I do. It's one thing to be overzealous. Scrupulosity is the word that we sometimes use in our day. It's this religious OCD that has us strain out every gnat. Now that's hard, but often that is more, that's uh, mental health that we need to work on. That is an overzealousness. That's boldness that's now overbearing. Uh, that, that's something we got to rein in our, bridle our passion so we can be filled with love. But the opposite side, to swallow a camel, Camels are listed specifically in the book of Leviticus as a no-no for the law of Moses. Camels are not kosher because they're, they, they chew the cud, but they don't have a cloven hoof. So you can't eat those. And the irony there on the list, I think that camels are the largest unclean animal in that part of the world. The biggest one that any of, Jew, of Jesus' listeners would be aware of. And for Jesus, again, this is why I would love the object lesson if we had a big enough bowl. Picture somebody with a glass of water that just has one little speck at the top, just a gnat. But then someone else has a bowl and there's like a camel floating around in it. All right, talk about a floaty. No amount of gentle exhaling will, will get it to the other side of the cup. And this one, oh, I wouldn't touch that without a good solid strainer. But this one will glug, 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 and you end up choking the whole thing down. This one, there seems to be almost humor. Is Jesus being comical here? Because the, the word picture he's painting, you choke on. And yet the Pharisees and scribes, they gulp the whole thing down. Guilty of such major transgressions when they are trying to make sure that no Jew on their watch will be guilty of the slightest indiscretion. We need to be careful about that too. And again, I'm not saying, oh, bottoms up for your glass full of gnats. Those can add up and cause some problems too. Uh, but beware the weightier sins. Do both, okay? Strain everything. Oh, verse 25 and 26. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, then the outside of them may be clean also. This goes back to the inward versus the outward. President Benson gave an amazing talk about cleansing the inner vessel and it was President Benson also that talked about the world's way of doing things is working from the outside in, when the Lord's way of doing things is working from the inside out. If we start from the outside in, we might end before we're done. Because look how good it looks, at least to people that are walking by. And isn't our facade sufficient? Looks good. Look at all these leaves. Don't come any closer. Well, just assume there's fruit in here. The outside of the platter looks wonderful. Well, the problem is that's not the part that's touching my food. <laughs> I'm more concerned about the inside. Let's make sure that that's clean, shall we? 
And then he uses another example of this that's world famous. Verse 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Oh, that's, that's such a great visual aid. Jesus is turning things inside out. And picture a sepulcher that's just been whitewashed. It's been painted so it looks so gleaming and, and new. Spotless white. Do you not remember this is a sepulcher? Think about what's happening on the inside as bodies are decaying maggots crawling through the flesh. I, mean, I hate to paint the disgusting picture, but Jesus is intending just that. Get past the whitewashed exterior and look inside, look deep. And what's crawling inside of you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites? There's things to clean up. There's things to change. Don't whitewash the outside. Allow me to shine the light into the deepest, darkest recesses of the soul. And let me cleanse your temple. No leaven found here. Remember Isaiah chapter 3? When Isaiah, well, the Lord through Isaiah turns the daughters of Israel inside out. And says, oh yeah, on the outside it looks like you have well-set hair. Well, just wait for it. You're going to be bald someday. And you're wearing beautiful clothing. Well, enjoy it while it's here. The day will come where you're in nothing but sackcloth and ashes. You look so beautiful today, it will be burning tomorrow. And it's, it's strong imagery that Isaiah uses. Here, it's even stronger. And the Lord is trying to expose the interior issues, rather than just checking off the box of some beautiful veneer. If you've ever read The Picture of Dorian Gray from, by Oscar Wilde, it's such an, a fascinating example of this issue. Because he makes a deal with the devil, basically, that he can live a sordid and evil -like life and not have it reflected in his countenance at all. Instead, it will be reflected in a portrait that he keeps hidden deep in the attic of his house. And he keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Morally, he just goes downhill. But he still looks on the outside like such a saint. This, the picture of innocence, when the real picture back at home is looking guiltier and guiltier by the day. There's a white sepulcher. And Jesus tears off the cover and shines the light on the portrait of, of who we really are. It's a haunting story. Verse 29 the Lord then gives them another woe. He's getting near the end of them. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous and say, Oh, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. We would have followed them. We would have, we would have obeyed, right? Oh, no. Wherefore, Jesus says, Ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. You're no better than they are. They killed the prophets of their day. You're killing the prophets of yours. Remember the householder keeps sending servants, but they keep getting mistreated generation by generation by generation. Lastly, I will send my son, my only son, my well-beloved son. What will they do to him? Jesus knows. He sees these scribes. He knows the, what they're writing down against him. He sees the Pharisees as they intend to break the law in condemning the lawgiver. He knows what's behind the leaf of every masked hypocrite. And he knows they're withering. But he calls them out. As you go around... Oh, garnishing the graves of the righteous, building tombs to the prophets, paying lip service to the past, even though your heart is far from prophets in the present. 
I'm really fascinated by this one because it goes along with what we said before about everyone always being one dispensation behind. And they'll honor the last dispensation's prophets because time has passed enough to vindicate those prophets. But as far as the prophets today, I don't have no proof. <laughs> the, there's not been enough time to confirm that they were right. Well, then you're living by sight instead of by faith. You're waiting for perfect knowledge and not allowing faith to, to function. You are building tombs to the past. And yet in some ways you're filling tombs with present prophets because you're sending them there early. It is unfair and again hypocritical of you to claim that you follow prophets when the prophets you happen to follow it's <laughs> there's no risk in following them. Those were your parents prophets. Did your parents follow them better or worse than you do? There's something fascinating here that he's getting at. I would even add that people can do this on a, a larger scale with, with Scripture. And there are those that oh, build memorials to the Bible, but are not willing to give the Book of Mormon the time of day. That, and maybe even in the church, that would honor... Joseph Smith, but not any of his successors. Or at some point, it's like, no, that's when it all went, went south. That's when it fell apart. And I'm a, a believer up until this point, but no further. Again, even those Bible-believing Christians, has the Bible become a tomb of the prophets? I know it's a tome. It's huge. But is it meant to be a tomb? No. It's meant to preserve past prophets, but also prepare us to receive present prophets. How are we doing with that? Next, verse 33, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? How's that for strong language? But unfortunately, as Jesus has come to see, nothing short of that is going to make a difference. Enos talked about the same thing and his struggle of, I just don't want to use words like this, but they won't listen to me otherwise. Mormon said the same, said the same thing at the end of the Book of Mormon. If I'm soft, they don't take it seriously. If I'm hard, they get offended by it. It's darned if you do, darned if you don't. And there's no Goldilocks zone here for, the, uh, for a preacher of righteousness in a day of wickedness. It's interesting because three years ago, John the Baptist said almost the same thing. Ye generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee the wrath to come. Well, the wrath is coming closer and closer. And here J Jesus says it again. Ye generation of vipers. There are still serpents in Eden. And yet the gardener of both Eden and Gethsemane is ready to cast them all out. Will they change? In verse 34 and 35, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes. Hmm, even scribes are sometimes a gift from God. Yeah, some experts in the law really are righteous. And some of them ye shall kill and crucify. Now, that's the state Crucifixion, that is, since only the Romans could impose capital punishment. But Jesus goes on, some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues. Ooh, synagogues, that's the church. So we got political opposition, we have religious opposition, it's all coming your way. He says they persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Now, how's that for the sum total of every martyr's blood? All mingled together at the base of that altar of sacrifice that John saw in vision in the book of Revelation. Jesus knows he's headed there too. That he will, his blood will join theirs. And he's warning these scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, these vipers of the wrath to come. The, wrath that, the, the pain of the piper because of their persecution. That's how John, uh, John Taylor ends DNC 135, by the way. It's some strong language to those that are guilty of the blood of the, of the prophet and the patriarch. Now, it's interesting that Jesus would list... I mean, there's a famous book from uh, Protestant Reformation days called Fox's Book of Martyrs, and it goes through all those who have been killed for the sake of truth. Well, Jesus has just raised his own Book of Martyrs there, and on the front end, it's righteous Abel, killed by Cain, and on the back end, it is Zacharias. Now, the tricky thing here, there was a 
prophet named Zacharias, uh, Zechariah in the Old Testament, who was stoned in the court of the house of the Lord. Now that sounds like this guy, right? That he, he was killed between the temple and the altar? The problem is that Zechariah was the son of Jehoiada. That, his story comes out in 2 Chronicles chapter 24. Uh, so the, the, we got the right first name, but not the right lineage. Now there is the prophet Zechariah, we've already seen today with the triumphal entry prophecy, but there's that minor prophet Zechariah. And he was, the, he, he, this is the right name with the right father's name. The problem is there's no record of his martyrdom. Hmm. So what's going on here? Now, it, probably the most likely is that some later scribe is conflating the names, and Jesus mentions the one that the earlier Zacharias, but the one the scribe remembers is Zechariah, son of Berechiah, and so let's put those two together. I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. As far as Jesus is concerned, there just have been, there's been an age of martyrdom. It will continue through his day and far beyond it. But this is guilt by association. And just like I will be associating my blood with the martyr's blood, you will be associating your guilt with the guilt of those who killed those who went before. I mean, to a Jewish ear, this would have been haunting because there's, there were some legends that grew up around the death of, Ze of Zechariah, son of Jehoiada, that his blood never dried it was just still there, kind of bubbling up from the earth, standing as a haunting witness as he demanded, his own blood demanding divine retribution to set the wrongs right. Well, is Jesus hinting at those kinds of things and warning these scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites of what they would face if they did not repent? Jesus then concludes it all in verse 36 where he says, Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. More blood than you could possibly imagine when the Romans come to destroy it all. It's in that moment that in Matthew 23, we see him weeping over Jerusalem. In Luke, he does it a little earlier, as I mentioned. And we're not going to take the time to study it today because we've spent too much time as it is. And to me, it's a beautiful introduction to what we'll study next week with the Olivet Discourse. Uh, to couch the signs of the times amidst Jesus' tears, I think is important. So we'll hold off till then. But uh, to this point, we're going to stop the synoptics. We're going to turn to John chapter 12. But just take a moment and reflect on what Jesus just did. Because it's strong. And in some ways seems a little out of his character. Well, it doesn't. It's so just, but he's motivated by mercy. He's trying to give them one last chance to change. And if I can wake you up and help you feel some godly sorrow, then it can work within you and you'll change. Even a viper can shed its skin and come out different. And I pray that you will. I weep that you will and weep that you probably won't. It's there that we shift to John 12. That didn't talk about a lot of the things we've already studied today. In 12, he, we see the, the anointing of Jesus. We'll study that later in the synoptics and bring him in to, to round out the story. But what we do see here in John 12 is is the last discourse he'll give the people in Jerusalem. The Olivet Discourse comes next week, uh, tomorrow, or tonight, I should say, if, if we're still in Holy Week, and this is still Tuesday, uh, where Jesus then leaves Jerusalem, begins to weep over it, and then describes the signs of the times of its destruction and the destruction at the end of the world. And that's what we'll study next week. It's so important. Second coming prep next week, and it's, it's incredible. But in the John version, since he doesn't talk about that, John leaves that to the synoptics. John does situate us still in Jerusalem where Jesus teaches the people publicly one last time. We start in chapter 12, verse 20, and think as we study this chapter about John's high Christology. His audience already knows the stories of Jesus. 
But do you know how glorious this Son of God really is? Have you been too caught up in his humanity and lost sight, at least a little, of his divinity? Well, look for divinity here. Verse 20, there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. Remember the way that we saw it? All, who's coming? The people coming down from, from Galilee. Uh, the multitudes that are curious, onlookers, spectators, rubberneckers, wanting to see Lazarus, wanting to see Jesus. They've all come. That's part of the triumphal entry as they're shouting Hosanna. But there were also among them these Greeks that had come to worship at the feast. Now, the feast is Passover. These Greeks are most likely Greek-speaking Jews from somewhere else and throughout the diaspora, somewhere in the Hellenized Roman world, speaking Greek but coming to Jerusalem because they're good, solid, practicing Jews that want to worship at the pilgrimage feast. The other possibility is that maybe they really were Greeks by birth and that they're Gentiles, but they're converts to Judaism. I mean, if Pharisees will go and compass sea and land to make one proselyte, well, other Jews are supposed to be sharing the gospel too. Well, maybe they joined Judaism as a result. These Greeks did. Either way, it says that they, the same came, therefore, to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him. Now, pause right there. I know there's a comma, and then the verse goes on, but I want to put a period there and just stop and think how Philip would feel if the verse really did end there. Now, Philip is actually a Greek name. It means horse. And... I wonder if these Greek, these Greek speaking Jews or these Greek converts, if they were drawn to Philip among the 12 because of his name. Was there some sense, it's like the German saints love Elder Uchtdorf and the Brazilian saints love Elder Suarez and we all love them both and, and we should. But I can see why some people feel a greater connection to specific apostles. And that might be the case here. But again, if we stopped it there and said, oh, they came desiring Philip. Well, imagine how Philip's feeling. It's like, well, I mean, of course they desire me. I am an apostle after all. I mean, for the last three years, I've been doing incredible things. So no wonder they desire me. Well, <laughs> don't go so fast. Don't get ahead of yourself, Philip. I don't think he did, by the way. It's not a period. It's just a comma, which lets you know there's something more to come. And what is it? Let's read the whole verse. The same came therefore to Philip, which, is, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, comma, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. And Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again, Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And then he can take it from there. What I love about that comma and the comment that followed it Oh, doesn't it put Philip and his so-called popularity into perspective? The only reason they wanted him is because they knew that he could bring them to Jesus. It's Jesus that we really desire. We only desire you to point us in Christ's direction. This to me is one of the most powerful cautions to teachers or leaders in the church that seem to be popular. Because the only reason people want to listen to those kinds of people is in hopes that those people can bring them to Christ. I'm grateful for this verse. It comes to mind when people try to give me praise, well-meaning, such, so kind on their part. I've learned that it's kind of false humility just to say, oh, no, 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 no. But it's true humility to accept the praise for what it is and pass it on to him who truly deserves it, like Jesus always did with the Father. And it's, it's wise and humble and honest of us to realize that it never was about us. It was always about Jesus. I'm grateful for those who want to come and spend this much time with me in Scripture. But believe me, I don't fool myself into thinking you've come for me. I know you're desiring Jesus. And I pray that I'm showing him to you. <laughs> Let me go run and find Andrew. Andrew always seems to know where Jesus is. And between the two of us, 
we'll find Jesus and we'll bring him right back. So just stay. I know you don't want me. You want him. Well, he comes. And what does he say to them and to everyone else? This is where the story picks up. And Jesus gives this final Johannine discourse. Verse 23. Jesus answered them. And how's this for high Christology? The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. My humanity, Son of Man, is about to be swallowed up in divinity. There's glorified. The Word made flesh, that's John chapter 1, right? Well, the flesh is going to return to Word status. Return to God Himself. He will be glorified. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now, what Jesus is describing there is the growth cycle for a seed. A seed doesn't die. That's strange language. A seed grows. It, it springs into real life. It, it meets its potential, fills the measure of its creation. You look at an oak tree, you look at a, a sequoia, and what are you seeing? You're not seeing a dead seed, you're seeing a living tree. But then again, the fact that it is a tree now means it's no longer just a seed. So in some ways, the seed has ceased to be. At least it ceased to be a seed. It's grown into something far greater now. And that's what Jesus is hinting at. What you see before you is a mortal husk. What, is, what lies inside is a divine kernel that's meant to grow from grace to grace eternally. But interesting, he would use the word die because that's what's weighing and heavy on his heart and mind. This is... Tuesday, after all. This is Holy Week, after all. And the garden and the cross and the tomb are all looming larger and larger. So forgive me if death is on the mind. It's on the horizon. But don't worry about that. Am I trying to convince you? Am I trying to convince me? Probably both. That as the, the kernel you see now, the husk, the seed, is going to change and be glorified. So wait for that. Hold out for that. I'm willing to give up my present in order to embrace a glorious future. He then says in verse 25, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. In the world to come, that is. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my Father honor. This is that lost and found paradox we saw him teach earlier. When he's sending forth the apostles, for example, and says, get lost. <laughs> really, lose yourself, and you'll end up finding a better version. That's what he's about to do. He does not love his life so much as to hold desperately onto it. He's willing to let it go. He's willing to lose it in order to gain something so much greater. And then he asks us to follow him. Oh, that's foreboding. It's not just follow me in life. It's follow me in death. Follow me in growth. Follow me in sacrifice. And in following me, you are following the Father. He's going to talk about the Father more and more and more as he gets closer and closer to reuniting with him. In fact, one of the most powerful and poignant comes in the next verse. Verse 27, Now is my soul troubled. This is one of those chances to really peek into the emotions of Jesus. And the closer he gets to Gethsemane and Calvary, the heavier it weighs on his shoulders. You can sense that here. My soul is troubled. But then it's almost like he's talking to himself. And what shall I say? I mean, what am, what am I going to say? What? It's too late to go back on the promise I made that I would come and fulfill God's will. That I am his word, made flesh, and God keeps his word, and I will too. So what am I supposed to say? I mean, here's one option. Father, save me from this hour. 
And believe me, I want to say that. In Gethsemane, I'll say it three times. But what else will I say? In Gethsemane, it will be, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Here, on the path towards it, it will be, but for this cause came I unto this hour. I love John 12, 27. Because you see the schism of soul within Jesus. You see his humanity and his divinity at war with one another. He is the proving of contraries. And this is divinity and humanity in a wrestle. This is spirit and flesh. We feel it every fast Sunday on an infinitesimal level compared to what Jesus is starting to feel here. I'm troubled. At least my mortal sight is. What does it want to say? I mean, what did I inherit from my mother, from Mary? I inherited mortality. I inherited the ability to die, and, and I'm going to have to embrace that ability. We talked about this in Mosiah 15 when Abinadi is trying to teach the people about the two sides of Jesus, his dual inheritance, his divinity and his humanity. The father side of Christ swallowing up the son side of Christ in glory. And that's what this high Christology John is allowing us to learn from the Lord. This is the son of man being glorified. This is the, the husk of wheat being finally unwrapped to show the glorious kernel. This is the seed dying to grow into the, the incredible plant, the tree of life itself. This is a troubled son submitting not only to his father, but to the father side of himself. What's the son side saying? Father, save me from this hour. And what's the father side re responding? For this cause came I unto this hour. It's the whole reason I'm here. And I will not shrink. It's decided. He's determined. And so in verse 28, he says, Father, glorify thy name. I know what it's going to take to do it, but do it. Glorify thy name. And then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have. Both glorified it. That's past. And will glorify it again. That's future. Can you picture a loving father in heaven reassuring a troubled son on earth? Your entire existence has been spent glorifying me. You did it in pre-mortality. You've been doing it throughout mortality. And now, as you head toward post-mortality, this will be your greatest act of glorifying me in all of history, in all of eternity. So, of course, I will glorify you again, just as you glorify me. Now, the people heard this. At least they heard something. It says, the people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. It's like, oh, there's some kind of, God must be, have a bass voice. <laughs> just this rolling thunder, and they just, they heard something from above. Oh, it just, it must be the weather. Well, it was something far higher than that. Others said, an angel spake to him. Well, you're getting closer, but you're still worlds away. Now, Jesus, on the other hand, knows exactly where that voice came from. And Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. You see, I don't need that divine backup, though I'm grateful to receive it. It's, the, it's you that need those kinds of divine reassurances. Now, my death is going to rock your world. You will wonder, you will question, you will worry, you will fear. Hold on to a voice. You sons of thunder, James and John, that wasn't thunder. That was my father. And he's going to glorify me. He'll glorify you all. In verse 31, Jesus then says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Satan's ultimate hopes were about to be permanently frustrated. 
Oh yes, he's about to bruise my heel, but in the process, I will crush his head and the prince of this world completely cast out. I'm passing judgment on the world, including worldly leaders. And then Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And there John interrupts to explain this he said, signifying what death he should die. Lifted up from the earth. Oh yeah, that's crucifixion. Jesus himself will draw upon that in 3527 in a beautiful way where he describes the gospel, not just as the fourth article of faith, but as the third article of faith infusing the fourth article of faith. Yes, your part is faith, repentance, baptism, Holy Ghost. My part is atonement and crucifixion. It's Gethsemane and Calvary, an empty tomb. It's me being lifted up by men so that I could lift you all up to the Father. There's something about being lifted up, raising your hand, for example, because it draws the eye. And so Jesus being lifted up on the cross, of course it will lift our gaze from the cares of the world up a little closer, a little higher to heaven. And to see him, to have our hearts drawn out in empathy and sorrow and compassion for him. That is the father drawing us to the son so the son can draw us to the father. I love that he's describing that right here among these Greeks and everyone else that's assembled to hear him. In verse 34, the people answered him, and they said, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So they still don't get it. Like, wait a minute, you're going to leave? I thought Christ was supposed to stay. Uh, hard sayings, who can hear it? I mean, are we, are we betting on the wrong guy here? What do you mean you're going to leave us? Who is this Son of Man? You see, we were expecting Son of God. Isn't that what we're getting? Well, yes, but he's Son of Man also. We just want the divine side. Well, this time around, you get more of the human side. Oh, you wanted lion. This time you get lamb. What you're banking on is actually the second coming. You lived for the first. Sorry. Do you understand what he's trying to help them understand? You... Don't mistake the, the first coming for the second. They're going to be very different. And this one, yes, the Son of Man will be lifted up. Now, Jesus says to them, Yet a little while is the light with you. And light has been a theme that John has focused on frequently throughout his gospel. Here it is, returning at the end, Jesus as the light of the world. And the darkness comprehended it not. This light is about to be swallowed up by the darkness, and yet in the process, the light will shatter the darkness forever. So yet a little while, he tells the people, the light will be with you. What are you supposed to do in the meantime then? Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light and then John says, these things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. So that's the end of this public discourse. And the rest of chapter 12 will be John clarifying some things, help narrating the rest of this story, Jesus saying a few words of his own, but not to the multitudes anymore, just to his chosen 12. I do love the way he ends this, though as he goes and hides himself. He's about to step off into the shadows. The night is coming. Perfect time to remind them of the importance of the light. And while you still have it, what will you do with it? Will you walk in that light? If I knew I was going blind, I think I would choose much more wisely what I fix my eyes upon in the meantime. Are there things I never want to forget? Things I want to emblazon upon the, the canvas of the mind so I can see them there, though I can't see them externally. If, I was, if darkness was setting in and I had a flashlight, but I knew the batteries were dying, where would I shine that light in its waning moment? 
most likely I would shine it in places so that I knew the lay of the land. So that once darkness descended, I could still get around and not be a blind guide or a blind man groping for the wall, to borrow Isaiah's language. While we have light, are we willing to see? Are we willing to embrace the light of the world? Are we willing to get our bearings and clarify our directions so that we can do what Brigham Young said, be righteous in the dark? Oh, what a blessing to still have the light of the world. Now, verse 37, as he's hidden himself from the multitudes, John gives us this. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. There's the darkness not comprehending the light. But rather than quote himself, John quotes Isaiah. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? This is John after the fact, years later, looking back, thinking of these times, these dark days, and lamenting that more people didn't come and see the light. He must have drawn some comfort from his Old Testament study as he went back to Isaiah and realized that, yes, I suppose this is how things had to be. At least these are, this is the way Isaiah prophesied they would be. But I love the chapter of Isaiah he's quoting there. It's Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report is the way the chapter begins. And Isaiah 53 is the greatest of the, of the servant songs in Isaiah. This is the one where he speaks of the atonement in some of the most graphic and specific of terms. Uh, John just quoted Isaiah 53 verse 1, but skip ahead to verse 3 and verse 5. And what's he say? He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Oh, yes, John knows what's coming as he's writing this. He keeps writing in verse 39, Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again. So he's on a roll. He wants to quote Isaiah a second time. He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. He just jumped back a few chapters and went from Isaiah 53 to Isaiah 6. This throne room epiphany that Isaiah has. Seeing the Lord in his glory, seeing himself in his own weakness, and being told about the weakness of those around him that would have blind eyes and deaf ears and hardened hearts. That's what he's up against. That's what Jesus was up against. In our day, maybe that's what we're up against too. Now, going away from Isaiah, coming back to his own narrative, John then says this in 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, which is shocking. Wait a minute, among the chief rulers, aren't they the ones that Jesus just chewed out through the entire chapter of Matthew 23? The chief rulers? Well, not all of them. Many, maybe most, were indeed scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. But some, among the chief rulers, many believed. Then why didn't they stand up for him? Why didn't they stop this? Well, here's why. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And that's tragic. Jesus had said, if you love me, then you're willing to lose your life. Well, they loved their lives and were willing to lose him. This sounds like the parents of the man born blind once he's healed. And they're like, oh, I don't know. You ask him, he's old enough because they don't want to be put out of the secular synagogue, as Elder Maxwell described it. Well, these Jewish leaders are no different. I wonder where Nicodemus is in all of this. Back in chapter 3 of John, coming in under cover of darkness, I want to see some light. I just don't want people to see me. Later, standing up cautiously, 
Are we sure we're going to condemn this Jesus character when we haven't yet tried him? Do we do it that way? Or is it innocent until proven guilty? And then they character assassinate him. And he's like, oh, okay, never mind, never mind. He's got to be among those who believe. Is Joseph of Arimathea among those who believe? Are there some, but they're not ready to come out of the shadows and into the light? The world is still too much with them. There's still too much fear of man. No wonder Jesus says in verse 44 through 46, He cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. There's no reason to fear man when God the Father will watch out for you. If you believe in me, you believe in him. I'm the light and the Father has sent me to shine in darkness. So come out from the shadows, please. Verse 47 and if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Sound like what he said to Nicodemus way back in John chapter 3? That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But then the next verse. That God didn't send me to condemn the world, but through me the world might be saved. Jesus is saying essentially the same thing here. I didn't come to judge the world. If I did, it would be condemned already. No, I came to save the world. So I'm not going to judge harshly or prematurely those that don't believe in me. I can afford to play the long game, to wait for prodigals to come to themselves. I don't have to pass judgment here. That's not my place. He says, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. <laughs> but like I said, it's not me. What is it then? The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. I love that Jesus doesn't take their rejection personally. I'm not going to judge. My words will. They'll stand there. Nephi said the same thing. Moroni said the same thing. The way Nephi said it, if you don't like my words, that's fine. Just believe in Jesus. He'll convince you whose words they are because they're his. Jesus has that same confidence in his word. It will stand and he doesn't have to personally pass judgment. The truth that he proclaimed will be judge enough. And so the chapter ends, verse 49 and 50. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say, and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. How's that for high Christology? How's that for Jesus who will now soon turn inward and begin the Last Supper with his chosen 12? That's what we see next in the book of John. We still have more to cover in Matthew, Mark, and Luke on the way to Thursday. What we'll see next week, later Tuesday, Hints at some possibilities on Wednesday. But to see the Olive, Olivet Discourse and the signs of the times, oh, I hope I haven't scared you off with <laughs> the eternal nature of this week's lesson because we have amazing things to talk about next week. But the way Jesus ended there, it's not about me. It's about my Father. How's that for high Christology? How's that for humanity bowing to divinity and sun side being swallowed up in Father's side? There's the light of the world. And will we emerge from the darkness to embrace that light? As he describes these commandments that God has given us, which are infinitely easier than the commandment that the Father has given the Son. And yet, how does the Son refer to God's commandments? Life eternal. I know I have to pass through death to get there. But on the other side of it all is eternal life. My wonderful friends, my long-suffering listeners, are you seeing Jesus? To go back to the question he asked earlier, but keeping it broad instead of specific. I'm not trying to trap you here and then ask you chicken and egg dilemmas. 
No, I'm simply asking that we all ponder Christ's question. What think ye of Christ? What do we think of him? Do we see in him the good father that I want to serve the moment he asks me to? Do I see in him the householder that makes me want to be the most righteous husbandman I can possibly be? Do I think of him as the son who's soon to be married and I, little old me, gets invited to the wedding feast? Will I come because of what I think of him? My prayer for all of us is that we think more about Jesus. That we take our palms and our garments and we lay them at his feet. That we shout Hosanna because we know that in him is salvation. I pray that we may desire anyone that can point the way to him. Because his way is life. And that life is everlasting.